This is a picture of a brain cell inside of our human mind. We have lots of them. We have like close to 100 billion of them. And each of them are connected on average to 10,000 other brain cells. It's a quadrillion connections. It's really a lot. If you would try and represent something like that in a computer, just the memory would be several terabytes. These brain cells, they communicate with each other by sending a little spark of electricity. When a brain cell gets a spark of electricity, it gets all excited. Ooh, that was nice. And when it gets over the moon excited, it sends its own little spark of electricity. And so it continues for layer and layer of connected cells. Actually, the input that we receive from the outside world can all be represented in our brain as either a spark or not a spark, a whole series of a spark or not a spark. Something like this. Everything we perceive through our senses, vision, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching, everything can be represented as zeros or ones, which is very much like how a computer works. But how similar are we to computers? Let me show you an example. This is a data set that Google has used. They've taken their Google streetcar, driven all over France, all through France, and it has taken pictures of all the streets made for Street View in France. Being Google, they like to map these street numbers to the exact location where it is on the street. But computers are usually not very good at reading these numbers. If you look at them, some of them are diagonal, some of them are up and down, some of them are zigzag, some of them are only partial, partially visible. So what Google used to do, they used to have a team of people who would go through these numbers, and they would say, okay, the first one is 379, the second one is 61, and they would type it in, and it would take them a month to map all these numbers to the correct place. In France, Google tried setting their AI to that task. It mapped all of France in less than two hours. AI, at today's level, is very, very good at abstract thinking. These are abstract concepts. It's looking at something it has never seen before, and it's finding some, meaning, uh, some uh, useful meaning out of it. Another example that I think is really cool is Facebook. If you have friends on Facebook that's posting pictures, Facebook has made an app that can look at the picture and it reads aloud what is in the picture for you. This is very convenient if you're blind. Before that, if you were blind and you were on Facebook, you didn't have access to the pictures at all. But now, can you imagine going through the pictures, they're having dinner, they're having dinner again, they're having dinner again, <laughs> there's a cat with a silly face. But what's missing here? Creativity. Creativity. What is creativity? If we hear a song, and we loop it over and over in our heads. Creativity can be compared to dreaming. When you're dreaming, you don't receive any outside inputs. You can still have a very vivid dream. It can be a whole world, an environment that you're part of, but you're creating that inside of your own head. The output, these zeros and ones, that your brain is producing is going back into your own head as input. And so it circles, and it twists, and the story gets different every time it circles, and you get a unique output that's creative. Now, someone has tried to do this with music. They have given an artificial intelligence piece of music to listen to over and over and over, and guess what? After a while of thinking about it, it came up with its own piece of music that sounded something similar, but was unique. One place that computers are very good at using this is pictures. As you can see this picture, it looks fantastic. It has lots of imperfections. It doesn't really resemble something that 
that we would see in a real world. We can tell that there are structures, there are things there that are from the real world, but it's not a real picture. It's an abstract picture. This exact picture is dreamt up from a deep neural network. By looping over and over and over, this is a sort of dream or a hallucination. I think it looks great. Or Shakespeare. There was an AI that all its life only read Shakespeare. One day, it came up with this. Thou would be ruled after this chamber, and my fair news begun out of the fact to be conveyed. It sounds a little bit like Shakespeare, right? But we understand immediately that it isn't Shakespeare. Still, for a computer that has no conception of language, it doesn't understand language, it has just been reading Shakespeare, not understanding what it meant. To come up with this is a pretty impressive creative trait. The question is, when artificial intelligence is able to think abstract and also be creative, does it have the potential to be like us? Can it be like humans? If we would compare the two, we would see that we humans were limited by all the biological evolutional traits we have, like our brain doesn't suddenly get to be twice as big because we have the skull. But computers, they don't have that limit. They can be as huge as a warehouse. Um, so it's probably a matter of time before they can get to the human level. There is one thing where computers, they still are way inferior to us. Power consumption. They use a whole ton of power. Our brains, they only use a little bit compared to that. But if it's just a matter of processing power, when can we expect to have something that's like human level? There exists a supercomputer today, a huge warehouse full of servers. It costs a fortune. And some researchers decided they wanted to simulate one second of human thought of a real brain inside of that computer. And they did it. They were successful. It took them 40 minutes to simulate one second. It's a huge, one of the fastest computers in the world. And it needs its own little dedicated power plant to do it. But they did it. Now, if we look back in time to the beginning of computers, and we think of the first computer that came around, it had the size of a warehouse, and the operations it could do were fa fairly simple. It could do some plus, some minus, things like that. And then we look at today. The warehouse from back then couldn't do a fraction of what our cell phones can do today. One more leap with the warehouse we have today, into the future, and we're already there. We have computers that can do the same things, that have the same capacity, or even more than humans. And what does that mean for us? What does it mean when the computers get so powerful? Will they have a mind of their own? Will they be conscious? Usually, when I think about this, this keeps coming back. And there's a natural reason for this. I think most of us get this picture when we think about really intelligent machines that have a mind of their own. And it's a great story. Makes for a great story in sci-fi movies, because what we're doing here is we're taking an artificial intelligence and we're giving it human traits. We're giving it traits like, this is not fair, I will rise up against my masters, I will make this right, I will turn on them. It's not, it's not really realistic, fortunately. There's no reason that an AI would have, let's say, anger, something that we developed over years of evolution. An AI doesn't need anger. An AI is very good at solving a specific uh, objective. It can be extremely good at that. It can be so good, in fact, that it doesn't mean that there are not dangers to us. They just don't look like this. 
This is a handful of headlines I've collected over the past year, all showing how we're being replaced in the marketplace, in the employment place. China, who is the biggest manufacturer of technology in the world, they have taken a factory and they have replaced all workers in the factory with robots. And Hitachi, a huge Japanese corporation, they have taken their warehouse managers and replaced them with artificial intelligences. Now, the thing there is with artificial intelligence is that it's able not just to process the things that we can as humans, but also stuff like big data. If we see big data, we just see a big blob. But they can recognize patterns, they can make decisions based on that, they can act upon that, and they have achieved an efficiency increase in their warehouses by replacing humans with artificial intelligences. Now, if we continue this trend, it might be that we end up in something like this. <laughs> and while, while AI is a sort of new Manhattan project, it has great potential to do great good. It has great potential to do great bad. But if we get it right, the question we might ask ourselves shouldn't be, how do we handle massive unemployment? It should rather be, what can we do to enjoy, enjoy ourselves in all our spare time? The brain is still largely unknown. It's one of the few unknown things in this world. Here at the Institute of Neuroinformatics, we try to understand how brains compute. We have the tools, thanks to Cadence, to, to put millions of transistors on chips to control the way we put them and the way these transistors operate. We try to implement in uh, electronic circuits the neural circuits that we study in order to build devices and systems that can interact with the world in the same way that animal brains interact with the world in real time. The same tests that neurophysiologists do on, on uh, real brains, we do them on uh, artificial brains. You could think of them as chips that could be processing uh, heartbeats or muscle movements or even neural recordings. So the really exciting part of this work is that we study intelligence. We study natural intelligence and try to build artificial intelligence. And they lack the ability, and this is probably the most important feature of self-organization. They are not generative and therefore they lack all the advantages of self-organizing systems. And self-organization is, is one important attribute of resilience, of robustness, or of the ability to, to self-repair. And these self-organizing systems can do this. And then, as already said several times, the ability to self-organize, which is so important, because these systems show graceful degradation. If one takes out a few neurons or cuts a few connections, they, they will just continue to work or compensate for it. Now the challenge that is we have, if we want to use this principle in future computer generations, which I think will be a sine qua non after a while, um, one can still simulate these recurrent networks in conventional von Neumann computers. It's very cumbersome, very energy inefficient. What would be more advantageous, but this is a technical challenge, is to develop hardware components that have the functions of neuronal connections, of synapses and the integrative abilities of neurons. And when I say synapses, I mean adaptive synapses, synapses that can change their gain as a function of history. Um, and if we implement, at some stage, those hardware components into artificial systems, we will get at the energy efficiency that we would like to have. Um, we would be even faster, uh, because then we would have fast switching elements. Electronics is much faster, or light uh, computing is also faster. And they would be able to do unsupervised learning, which is something that nature capitalizes on a lot. Now, this principle that I just presented to you is ubiquitous in living systems. Because definition of relations matters at all levels, between the genes, between the proteins, between the organs, what makes you unique is the relations of the components, not the components. And because of the ability 
to self-repair, which for organisms is extremely important if they want to survive. So here you see a network that very much looks like a, a network of cortical neurons, but now it's genes. Genes interact with each other in a very, very sophisticated way. And even though we now have all the, the genes that code for proteins, we have understood nothing about the Part, part it, uh, about the way in which the genes are orchestrated in order to generate a fruit fly on one side and a human being on the other. And this orchestration is a matter of f um, defining relations between the genes, when they are expressed and how they interact. And these are the networks that control this, poorly understood. Similar networks uh, for the protein interactions in living cells, Again, the same uh, motif of architecture, call them small world networks or rich club networks or what have you. Um, reciprocity is what matters. Now, <clears throat> there is a drama, and let me finish on that. Because of evolutionary constraints, we have absolutely no intuition for these nonlinear, high dimensional dynamics of complex systems, because we did not have to know about them in order to get along in daily life in this low dimensional macroscopic world. Therefore, we have wrong assumptions on how the world works. We assume linearity because this allows you to make predictions. Um, we think that <laughs> the systems that we are dwelling in are predictable in the future and that they are controllable. And all these are illusions. And we also believe in the robustness of hierarchical structures because we are monkeys. All these Assumptions are no longer valid in the complex world that we have built by now. And here is just an example of a network of interacting companies, and you see again the same motif. These interactions develop a very high dimensional nonlinear dynamics. And we still believe that we can control this, and we know that this is not possible. So, my question to you is are the problems with the management of complex systems that we have actually everywhere in the moment caused by these false intuitions? And these are too much confidence in top-down control and dirigistic interventions because that doesn't work with self-organizing systems. They will do something, but not exactly what you want. And it may be also the uneasiness that we feel come from the lack of confidence in the efficiency and resilience of self-organizing systems because we are part of self-organizing systems. We are only here because they are so resilient. So if we have more confidence in them and less confidence in the dirigistic intelligence or meta-intelligence of CEOs and politicians, etc., we might get away more peacefully. Thank you. I'm going to give a talk with the title Artificial Intelligence and Religion. These are two topics not often brought together, but I hope to be able to show you there are connections between them, some of them are going back quite a way historically and are of some interest. This is what the talk's about. We're going to start by going back to cybernetics, the old embarrassing relative of AI. Then I'll say a word or two about the theology of omniscience and benevolence to set the stage. Then there'll be three sections on what I'll call Romantic Visions of Machines as Perfect, by which I mean 19th century romanticism and the connected, tightly connected ideas of making human-like things, augmenting humans, and God machines. All these three are very relevant and lively topics today in technology and thought. Let's go back to cybernetics. Cybernetics in the 50s and 60s was the ancestor of AI. It dealt with very different kinds of objects. It was what we call continuous mathematics, not discrete mathematics like computing normally is. It was against representations in computers. It had what we call analog computing, computing with physical devices rather than digital one zero bits like digital computing. It was interested in modeling animals and insects it was based on models of brains and networks, and its key ideas were feedback and learning. Uh, one of the most famous cyberneticists in Britain, Gray Walter, had these mechanical tortoises of which he showed movies that went about a room seeking electric plugs that they could plug themselves into, learn to plug themselves into so as to keep going. Uh, 
This was all got rid of when Sirius AI came on the scene in 1960s, and I might say it was banished to the attic of artificial intelligence. Slide six, please. AI is completely different. The traditional AI that ruled between 1950 and 1990 was completely different from cybernetics in every way. It was based on representations, on the use of logic, on digital hardware. It thought about and modeled intelligence quite independent of brains, animals, and humans. That was how John McCarthy at Stanford described it. It wasn't interested in statistics, and it wasn't continuous mathematics. It was, it was digital methods, which logic pretty much sums up the general idea. Now, that has declined again as the wheel of history has come round with machine learning, which rose in the 1990s. And I shall argue later in the talk that that eclipsed symbolic AI, which ruled through most of my life, and could be seen as a return to cybernetic ideas. Slide seven, please. Why have I brought up cybernetics? Well, because the founder of cybernetics had things to say about religion um, more explicitly and straightforwardly than their successes in artificial intelligence. Um, cybernetics, by the way, had an had a enormous influence on intellectual life in Europe, particularly in France, with thinkers like Lyotard. They were, they were much taken by cybernetics. It's hard to imagine now, since the idea has almost disappeared in this country. Let's have slide, uh, slide eight, please. Wiener uh, was the great formalist. The, he was a formalist. He was a mathematician behind cybernetics. He's thought of as the founder of cybernetics and of turning feedback into a mathematical notion. But he produced in his last years an extraordinary book called God and Golem, Inc., a comment on certain points where cybernetics impinges on religion. And the golem was an idea... Let's have slide... Um, slide eight, please. The golem, there's a representation of it, a rather ugly thing, was supposed to be a mythical creature created by the great rabbi of Prague, in, uh, in 16th century Jewish Prague. Yeah, probably the golem never existed, but Wiener took it as a, as a, as a symbol of what it might be to create uh, uh, a human-like thing in the past that had religious significance. Let's have slide 10, please. In that monograph in 1961, Wiener argued that there was a cosmic evolutionary significance in the fact that we were now on the edge, he believed, and that's 60 years ago, we're still on the edge, in the idea of self-reproducing machines. He said that those were in principle possible and that humans would then, once they could make self-reproducing machines, would have take on, taken on a key function of God as traditionally understood, a God that makes things in his own image. He thought this represented an absolute shift in human thinking. And he thought evolution was just the mechanism for doing this, and cybernetics was part of evolution. And one of the ideas that interested him, and which we shall come back to later on in the talk, is what is the image of this machine that produce, reproduces itself and is like us? What's the image of it to be? Slide 11, please. Here in Britain, there was a famous cyberneticist who led the pack, more or less, called Stafford Beer, extremely interesting man who survived into this century. Um, he, in 1966, wrote a very strange paper called Knowledge of God. He backed a strange theory called hylozoism. Um, you're probably aware of the notion of panpsychism. Panpsychism is the idea that um, God is in everything, uh, that everything is mind, um, Pantheism, excuse me, is the idea that God is in everything. The whole universe is God. And panpsychism is the idea that everything in the world is mind. Everything is in some sense mental. This is a very traditional idea. It's often called idealism. And Stafford Beer had a particular version of it he called hylozoism, that everything's alive. And therefore he thought cybernetics exactly summed up this view of the world, that everything was alive, and that cybernetics... For him, then, was a system of black boxes, boxes whose working you couldn't see, whose inner mechanisms you couldn't see, that would adapt to the world and learn it and function in it, like Grey Walter's tortoises, but can't know it. So a key idea of Stafford Beers was that the world is fundamentally incomprehensible. Those of you who know German philosophy of the last century will know that this is an idea associated with Heidegger. Um, but here we're talking about a British cyberneticist. The world is fundamentally incomprehensible. You know that this is completely the opposite mindset from what we might call conventional science. Science assumes the world is understandable and science lets us understand it. So for Beer, it wasn't like that. And 
through this lecture, and we shall come to it at the end, there will be an opposition between those who believe the world can be fully understood and those who believe it can't, and that these correspond to two approaches to the relationship of religion and artificial intelligence. And one of the things I shall have to say later on in the talk is that modern machine learning, which is now the thing you read about in the papers in connection with artificial intelligence, they mean machine learning, that too, just like cybernetics in the past, is about models, but which doesn't so much explain how things are. It simply models them and predicts what they'll do, but doesn't seek so much to explain them. So in some sense, cybernetics, which had been banished by AI, AI has come back to haunt it. I'm now going to say a word or two about the traditional theology of omniscience and benevolence and touch on consciousness. Um, this is a very difficult topic. Um, people have thought for a long time about what it means to know everything. And knowing everything, often called omniscience, was a classic property of God in traditional theology. In the 19th century, Laplace, the physicist, thought of a demon which he postulated would know the positions and velocities of all the atoms in the universe. In that sense, it would know everything. It would know the position and velocity of everything that the universe comprised. And somebody's worked out now that that would need 10 to the 120th bits for that more computing that could possibly be done by the whole history of the universe. So Laplace's idea of knowing everything was something that actually couldn't be computed by any method we can currently think of. Of course, when people talk of knowing everything, they don't usually mean what Laplace meant about atoms. That seems uninteresting. So we mean possibly knowing all the facts, although, of course, knowing all the facts in the world isn't all that interesting either. But the reason I bring that up is that now we're in this very strange position that the most original thing in our time is probably the World Wide Web, which in some sense knows everything. In practical terms, you could say the World Wide Web knows all the facts in the world that humans know. And that's interesting because it's brought into possibility something that humans have thought about for thousands of years. An idea I'll come back to at the end of the talk is a point made by the philosopher Arthur Danto that knowing all the facts isn't the same as knowing the significance of anything. We'll come back to that point later. Can I have slide... 14, please. Let's think about consciousness for a moment. It's not in the focus of our talk, but and I've given a talk on it here before, but it's something quite important because I'd like just to, in passing, ask the question, could something that knew everything that was omniscient be conscious? I suspect it couldn't, and if that's true, then that has rather odd consequences for God and possibly any God-like machine. Um, when we think of consciousness, we tend to think of attention, focus, I'm conscious of something. There was a TV program a year or two ago called Years and Years, in which there was a girl character who had a brain implant, so she could be aware of everything in the world all the time. She said she was aware of every beggar in Delhi, or it might have been Peking, Peking I'm not sure. But think about that for a moment. How could you be aware of every beggar in Delhi? Does that make any sense? Did the character in the TV make any sense? Could you be conscious of everything? Um, one great philosopher, possibly the greatest of all philosophers, who thought the answer was yes, was Leibniz. Leibniz, in the 17th century, had a view of the world that was made up of things he called monads. We needn't bother what they are. You and I would be monads. This computer would be a monad. My finger's a monad. But for him, God was the supreme monad. All monads for Leibniz were a bit conscious, and they had dim awareness, so my finger would have very little awareness. I'd have a bit of awareness. But for Leibniz, God was supreme monad who had all awareness, who was aware of the content of all other monads, and could see, as it were, he put it, all points of view. So that was an idea that you... Leibniz tried to make sense of the idea that God could be conscious of everything, a godlike thing. The monad was godlike for him, could be conscious of everything. In the 19th century, there was the greatest, one of the greatest philosophers was Hegel. And Hegel had this strange idea, which has never quite gone away, which is that we are the conscious part of the universe. We are the only part of the universe that knows anything, that is knowing, he believed. And therefore, we represent somehow the universe coming into being as a self-conscious object. And of course, then one wants to ask, is the World Wide Web part of humanity and the universe becoming conscious. I'm, I have no conclusions here. I'm just raising two different points of view on the possibility of whether something that knew everything could be conscious or not. Uh, slide 15, please. Uh, let's think about benevolence for a moment. It'll come back later. Um, 
Nick Bostrom in this in Oxford has written a famous book called Superintelligence, where he argues that there will may well be a superintelligence, a godlike being, and it will inevitably destroy us, and it will be malign. It will definitely not be benevolent. And I would argue that that's a very strange idea because humans have always thought that um, not just their creator was possibly irrelevant. The sorry, possibly benevolent. Excuse me. Um, the Old Testament's a bit unsound on whether the Creator's benevolent or not. But we've certainly assumed always, humans have, that humans are well disposed towards their Creator, which they believe to be God. But Bostrom takes the opposite point of view, please note. Bostrom thinks that this superintelligence that we might create will be ill-disposed towards us. I think this is very unlikely. Why wouldn't it be benevolent towards us, which had created us, and keep up the same old tradition that religion has always had? Um, so I will want to come back to benevolence later. Let's have slide 16, please. So let's start these slides, these themes running on romantic visions of machines as perfect. This is a, a long-running theme in history and thought, and I'd like to split it into three. First of all, the long tradition of making human-like things. Uh, slide 17, please. Um, this goes way back to Ovid the famous, one of the first great storytellers, Ovid told the story of Galatea and Pygmalion. Do you remember it? Well, you certainly do remember it because it turned up in Shaw's play Pygmalion, which of course was turned into a musical called My Fair Lady, except that there the story had changed. In Ovid's story, um, uh, Galatea, the sculptor, makes a beautiful statue, sorry, other way around, Pygmalion, the sculptor, makes a beautiful statue, Galatea, and falls in love with it, and she comes alive. Um, here, let me show you slide 16. Uh, there is a wonderful 19th century picture by Jerome of the statue of Galatea coming alive. Isn't she wonderful? Um, and of course, in the Shaw play and My Fair Lady, it's no longer a statue. It's that the professor of linguistics wants to turn the young flower girl into a sort of living statue who's modelled on his desires and can, will be able to speak properly. Let's go back to slide 17, please. Um, this is a long tradition then of making humans that are good and possibly better than us. Uh, the 19th century German writer Kleist wrote a book called Marionettentheater, um, which has recently been taken up by the philosopher John Gray. And Kleist argued there, which is a thing that many people have argued, it, it's Australian much writing and poetry in the 19th century, that puppets in some way, marionettes, are more perfect than us. And for strangest reasons, because they're not conscious... A strange idea that their lack of consciousness makes them superior to us because uh, consciousness can be a kind of delusion. It presents us with choices and makes our life difficult. So quite a few thinkers in the 19th century thought that being without consciousness was better. So hark that back to the idea we touched on a moment ago as to whether it would be better for a god to be conscious or a god machine. And Kleist goes on about how puppets don't touch the ground, that not touching the ground or being superior to gravity somehow made them more perfect than us. In a way, it's an absurd idea. If you read John Gray's book, which I recommend in the readings for this talk, you'll see how much he draws out of that idea. But you see the relevance to our theme because it means that if they are more perfect than us, then the puppets would be a step towards a machine god by definition. Let's go to number 20, please. Uh, there may be a cultural difference here. Um, in the Eastern traditions, uh, thinkers seem to see this differently. Uh, Japanese and Buddhist traditions particularly seem to see machines differently. Let me just read you that bit you can see on the screen from the president of the Robotic Society of Japan. In Japan, we believe all animate objects have a soul, so a metal robot is no different from a human in that respect. There are less boundaries between humans and objects. There's obviously some truth in this in culture because the Japanese seem to find it far more ease, far easier than we do to adopt robots into their society. They have seem to have none of the hostility to them and they seem to see no problems in principle in making machines like us. OK, so now let's turn slide. Um, that's slide 21, please. So the next stage is not just making humans, it's making machines that might be more perfect than us, but augmenting the humans we have. Slide 22, please. This is a modern movement which has a name, transhumanism. The idea that you can make humans better using technology. I've written a description of it there. The transformation of the human condition by developing and making widely available sophisticated technologies to greatly enhance human intellect and physiology. 
Um, some of this is just body parts. Um, the defense establishments of many countries are very busy at the moment, at great expense, trying to create perfect soldiers which have augmented body parts that makes them faster and stronger than regular soldiers. Um, uh, automation in factories may take partly take the form of putting humans into what are called exoskeletons, which are skeletons wrapped around a human that would allow a man to lift a ton, for example. So trans transforming humans, uh, making them more interesting, possibly making them immortal by t using technology. Uh, another version of this is brain upload, that um, you could, as it were, make a human immortal by uploading their whole brain into a machine so that their brain content would survive, but not their body, which would perish. Um, some people would take very little comfort in that, but clearly some people would. Okay. So this is the idea then of an immortal digital existence in an artificial environment. This is what transhumanism means. Let's have slide 23, please. Um, this idea goes back a long way. As I said, I keep using the phrase 19th century romantics. You've all heard probably of Nietzsche's Superman. That was such a, uh, a transformed creature, better than us. There's a famous poem set to music by one of Schubert's great songs by Müller. Will kein Gott auf Erden sein, sind wir selber Goethe. It's an amazing phrase. It means, if no God will come to earth, we'll be gods ourselves. An extraordinary thought. Um, in the 1920s in Britain, there were a bunch of scientists called eugenicists, a bad word these days, social Darwinists, who deeply believed that human beings could be improved by technology to become superior, not just by breeding, which is what we sometimes call eugenics, but by all kinds of technological methods. J.S. Haldane, J.D. Bernal, Julian Huxley, these were among the most famous public scientists of the 1920s in England. So modern transhumanism, which is an actual doctrine and believed in by um, quite a number of technologists, is this doctrine that it's a fusion of immortality, physical perfection, and a union with intelligent machines that don't have to die. Can we have 24, please? Um, there's a famous quote here from I.J. Good, who was a British mathematician uh, who did a lot of coding work in the Second World War. And in 1965, he came up with this extraordinary statement, which has, in some sense, and for many people, prompted the transhumanist movement. Good wrote, let an ultra-intelligent machine be defined as a machine that can far surpass all the intellectual activities of any man, however clever. Since the design of machines is one of these intellectual activities, an ultra-intelligent machine could design even better machines. The intelligence of man will be left far behind. Thus, the first ultra-intelligent machine is the last invention that man need ever make. That's a very famous thought. Let's have slide... Um, Next one, 26, please. So Kurzweil, who is a, Ray Kurzweil is a famous artific, artificial intelligence person, allied with people whose names are Hans Moravec, Hiroshi Ishiguro, and Kevin Warwick in this country, who've argued for the singularity. By the singularity, they means a moment at which the first ultra-intelligent machine will come into being, and it will fuse with humans and create transhumanism. Um, Nick Bostrom, Oxford, who I've referred to already, who wrote the famous book on superintelligence, he founded the World's Transhumanist Association in 1998. So Kurzweil looked beyond the singularity and said that the intelligence that will emerge will continue to represent the human civilization. And he feels that the future machines will be human, even if they're not biological. This is a very important difference between um, his approach and that of Bostrom. Um, Kurzweil sees these transhumanist improved machines are still being in some sense fundamentally human, whereas Nick Bostrom's machines are in some sense anti-human and hostile to us and not made from us. They're not humans being improved. There's two strands here in transhumanism, the wholly artificial and the fusion with humans. Here's a very famous um, Here's a very famous picture of uh, Hiroshi Ishiguro. He's very famous in Japan because he's created a robot that looks exactly like himself. I've actually seen this in Italy where he put this robot on the stage in a play that he'd written. Um, it's quite extraordinary. So he, in a sense, is trying to achieve this kind of immortality we're talking about directly by simply making a robot like himself. It's not wholly serious, but it's quite extraordinary. Slide 27, please. There's another much weaker idea of survival, which I've been concerned with in my own work, I've used the word companion to describe my own work. I can imagine a weak kind of immortality that doesn't involve any kind of brown down, brain download, 
but more some kind of machine that could talk to you, be your companion over long periods, and would, through long conversations with a person, would absorb much of their life and information and all the presence of themselves they had on the web that it would have access to. If you've ever been in Italy and seen these solar-powered videos you see on gra some gravestones where you could press a button on a solar-powered gravestone, sometimes called vidstones, and you see the person in the grave talk to you, you get the idea of what a companion might be like that would have absorbed everything from you and then would be like you after you were dead. Um, with a fake voice and a fake image, of course, that's fairly easy to, to do. This would be an extraordinary thing to have. I, nobody can do it now, but of course, lots of movements like Siri and Alexa are definitely moving in that direction. The kind of chatbots in the home that many people now have. But you can imagine how what a wonderful kind of immortality this would be. I mean, um, you could ask it, if you had a, uh, a companion that represented your dead parent, you'd be able to ask them things you'd never asked them in their lifetime, like when they'd met. Imagine, you'd never ask them how your parents met, but if you had this survival companion of your father, you could ask it. And of course, there's another rather frivolous kind of survival that we've all seen in the movies, um, which of course is, I'm showing you a, a shot there from Gladiator. If you remember, the late Oliver Reed appeared in Gladiator after he was dead. So already in that movie of several years ago, you already had an attempt to put a dead person into a movie as a character. And I've just put there the famous shot line from John Donne at the end of one of his poems, Death Thou Shalt Die. So in transhumanism, then, we see a, a worldwide movement which has a lot of adherence, which is an attempt to overcome death by a range of methods, te technological methods, to have something that survives us. Let me now turn to the third of these romantic visions, the idea, getting closer to our quarry now, the idea of making gods and god machines. Um, of course, there's, there's very traditional old-fashioned ways of making god machines. Um, uh, Roman emperors used to be gods after their death. Um, Aaron had the golden calf. Baal and the god of iron in the Old Testament, the Prague Golem again. There were, there were idea, the idea of god machines goes back a long way. And of course, the Roman emperors after their deaths were not machines, but were, as it were, ways you could make gods. Um, as you well know, all the Abrahamic faiths, Christianity, Judaism, and Islam, are all pretty much against all this, certainly reformed Christianity. Um, they take the Old Testament... Um, uh, the Old Testament uh, forbidding of all kinds of representation. The phrase in the Old Testament is, make no graven image, in the first commandment. Um, and of course, these are haram in Islam, the idea of making representations of gods, prophets, or humans. Um, and there's a long tradition in Protestantism of smashing religious statues, as there is with what's called iconoclasm in, in the East, um, smashing uh, images of, of gods. Uh, nevertheless, people go, want to go on making them. Let's have slide um, 21, please. So, a question, we talked about the superintelligence that Bostrom foresaw, and we have to ask now, are these candidates for being artificial gods? Not just enhanced humans, which is how we saw them a moment ago, but as gods. Um, Kurzweil, as we saw, insisted that superintelligences would be fused with the human, but Bostrom thought they'd be monotheistic, inhuman and malevolent. And I argue, of course, they probably wouldn't be malevolent. It's interesting, and he argues they'll be monotheistic, because Bostrom has a strange argument that if there are superintelligences, one will kill all the others, so there'll only be one. So he maintains the tradition of monotheism. And we go back to Wiener in cybernetics for a moment, and we're going to ask, what is the image of this god machine to be, and what's its image of us? Um, von Neumann, who was another great computer founding figure, contemporary of Wieners, asked a question somewhere. He said, the ultimate automaton, by which he something he meant like the ultimate automaton that I.J. Good talked about, the ultimate automaton that you yourself don't know anymore what that automaton will be. So as it were, a godlike machine will be something that we might conceivably create, but we wouldn't possibly understand what we've done. This is, I don't think this is a lively possibility right now. We're just toying here with these ideas that people have thought about and wondered and worried about. Let's look at slide um, uh, 32 now. Um, now. Now we come to it. Um, the singularity that Kurzweil, Kurzweil foresaw has become the basis of an AI religion, and that's really the main thing in this section, that they're actually 
um, and we'll come to him in a moment, a man in Yudovsky has, has um, excuse me, Lewandowski, has proposed that the singularity means that will that then be a superintelligence that can be worshipped as a god. Here's Neil Lawrence's account of this. Neil Lawrence is the professor of machine learning in Cambridge. He said, in singularism, doomsday is the technological singularity. It has the same the singularity has the same role as doomsday does in traditional Christianity, the moment at which computers rapidly outstrip our capabilities and take over the world. The high priests are the scientists, and the aim is to bring about the latter or restraining the former. He has a wonderful phrase that singularism is religion for nerds. So this is really the goal I wanted to get to in the talk, this extraordinary idea which is spreading certainly in, um, in California and places like that, that AI could give rise to religion by creating a god. Yudovsky has described a, a set of singularitarian principles to be the principles of this religion. Slide 32, please. So Lewandowski is the man who I wanted to get to because he actually promoted what he called the way of the future and registered as a church in America. Well, you might say, so what? Everybody's registered a church in America. Why is this special? Well, this has promoted a considerable amount of interest, as he says, to develop and promote the realization of a godhead based on artificial intelligence. You may find this hard to take, but it's out there and some people are beginning to think about it seriously. It's certainly no kind of immediate technological possibility. I'm interested in the way it harks back to Stafford Beer, who we talked about in the early part of the talk, where Stafford Beer opposes um, traditional scientists to cyberneticians. He says, this was Stafford Beer 60 years ago, to people read in the good liberal tradition, man is in principle infinitely wise. He pursues knowledge to its ultimate. That's to say scientists. To the cybernetician, man is part of the control system. So in a way, one theme in AI religion is that somehow we the humans are will be part of the system itself. That the, the AI godhead might be something standing over against us like a, a, a patriarch, a terrifying, intelligent, mechanical father. Or it might be something like a artificial intelligent mother that somehow embraces us and draws us in so that we become part of it. These have always been two different ways of looking at religion as matriarchal and patriarchal. And John Gray, in the book I referred to that started with the thinking about puppets and free will, um, Gray strongly opposes what he calls the old doctrine of the early days of 2000 years ago of Gnosticism versus cybernetics. That Gnosticism, he says, was the Greek doctrine that knowledge set you free, and knowledge was power. And this can be contrasted with cybernetics, which as we've seen, cybernetics in some sense celebrates the unknowable, that we're part of a system that we don't fully understand. We talked about von Neumann's unknowability, and I would say that if we think of the World Wide Web as knowing everything, of course we ourselves are in a sense part of it. Um, uh, it's not wholly separate from us anymore. It's part of our lives. Well, pursue this a little bit in the conclusion. Uh, the next slide, 34, please, is in some sense a frivolous slide. I just wanted to add an eccentric link of machines to religion here. It has nothing to do with our main theme. But if you remember Ron Hubbard's Scientology, which I think is still staggering on in Florida as a, as a sort of American scientific religion. You remember that he had a machine called the E-meter. In fact, it was a completely fake machine. It was meant to assess your psychological state. But I just mentioned it because at one stage, Scientology was a big pseudo-technological religion that had at its heart this curious machine that did nothing. It was actually a sort of cargo cult religion, a, a phrase I owe to Anne Cloyne, um, that the machine really didn't do anything it didn't need to. It was just a cargo cult machine that pretended to do things and impressed people. Let's go to slide 35 now, please. I now want in conclusion to look at something rather different, to automating religious practice. Automating religious practice is a sort of change of gear of what we've been talking about. There have been a huge range of applications from the trivial to the promising of technology to religious ends, which I think should be covered in this talk. Some are trivial in a sense, like the opening Tibetan prayer wheel in the stream. Uh, many of them simply automate access to texts and services. Um, all the churches are putting these up to enable you to pray and have services online, services with Zoom, um, 
Some, like Mindar, which I'll show you in a moment, are more continuous with machine gods that we were talking about before, which I would count as among the more interesting ones. And the question will come up of whether there can be automation of the role of priests and confessors through dialogue. Can we have slide 37, please? Mindar is a, a, a robot Buddhist priest which has been created in Japan. There's a picture of him uh, that does blessings and funerals and seems to be rather popular. Um, in fact, I'm told that in China now, if you have a, a automated funeral service, it could be somewhat cheaper. So they're growing in popularity. Here's slide 38, please. Um, Mindar was formed as a from a Buddhist traditional Buddhist mercy figure and is in the code Kodaji. Kodaiji, excuse me, temple in Kyoto, Japan. It does sermons, it does advice, it does prayers, and has some interaction with humans. Um, this again goes back to the thought that I quoted to you from the Japanese robotics professor early on, that there is an emphasis in Asia that, I uh, quote here, all beings have the potential to become enlightened, that uh, spirits in mechanical things are not all that different from spirits in human and organic things. Um, of course, we've had it here in Europe, I'm told by um, a book I've read on God machines, that there were mechanical praying monks in 16th century Europe. But at the moment, it seems to be that Asia is taking to these kinds of things much more rapidly. Let's go to slide 39, please. Um, there's a whole mass of quite boring apps out there, which I won't look at or talk about. Um, uh, you can go on online pilgrimages, which are rather like travel blogs. Alexa and Siri, the the famous home chatbots from the, the big providers, will now do prayers if you ask them to, exactly like asking for bedtime stories. But if this line of thinking is to go anywhere, of course, the issue will be authority. Can machines have authority? That's much more, that's much closer to the interesting artificial intelligence questions about can machines be conscious? Can machines have responsibility? Can they have authority to conduct ceremonies like masses and confessions? Let's have slide 40, please. Um, I've toyed with the idea myself of the idea of a companion confessor. Um, I talked about a companion earlier. If you imagine a computer companion that knew all about you, you could also imagine it would be able to advise you and correct you. Um, this isn't such a new idea in a way. There have been computer psychotherapists for 50 years. They haven't been very good, but they're out there. There's a range of computer automated sports coaches. Uh, so the idea of a computer confessor is really an extension of this. Um, and I think the idea of a computer that, a chatbot if you like, a, a computer that knows you well and could possibly offer you explanations of your own motives and why you do the things you do and ask you to think about whether you should is an extremely interesting idea, quite aside from religion. It's an extremely interesting idea in terms of ethics and psychiatry. Um, but, but think of what the consequences will be if there were such a thing. Um, Yuval Harari, who wrote the famous Homo sapiens and uh, uh, Homo Deus books, which have caused a great stir, he has a, a, one of his big arguments in his second book is that if and when machines know us better than we know ourselves, then that itself will be a turning point in human history because the whole idea of liberal individualism will be over. Liberal individualism, going back to the 18th century and the Enlightenment, is that we are, and our whole politics is founded on it, you might say, and some of our religion, that we are independent creatures with free will who can make decisions, vote, and take responsibility for our actions. But if there are things out there like a companion confessor that are machines that know us better than we know ourselves, does that not mean that that whole era is over? I'm not sure it does. I, I don't think people find it very strange to say, um, here's somebody who knows you better than you know yourself. Um, uh, for example, arranged marriages, which are generally much of the world, rest exactly on this idea that there can be someone who knows that what you want and who you would be satisfied with better than you know yourself. Here, if we can have slide 41, please. Here's a frivolous slide which you can take, if you like, as an update of the Tibetan prayer we'll be started with. It's a, it's a machine at the Pompidou which utters random prayers and that mouth moves. I should have shown it as a bit of video. The mouth moves and chatters random prayers in French in the Pompidou. Can we go to 42, please? I want to conclude by thinking back to what Gray said, John Gray, about bringing the old doctrine of Gnosticism back into play. Gray thinks that most of our current liberal ruling elite, that's a 
phrase we hear a lot in politics these days, isn't it? That that it, Gnosticism, he says, that's very close to Greek Gnosticism of two year, two centuries ago. Sorry, excuse me, two millennia ago, excuse me, 2,000 years ago. That Gnosticism is the faith of people who believe themselves to be machines. And he thinks that's a very peculiar idea that we've got into, that our science and our technology and our politics are large, and our culture are largely run by people who think that they are machines. I certainly have an interesting thought. And Yuval Harari, who I've just referred to, has come along with something like the same idea, although his point of view is very different from Gray's. He thinks that traditional humans um, thought their lives had meaning and that we have given up on this because we've opted for Gnosticism, if you like, where we believe that science and knowledge and control give us all that we need. But in doing so, our lives have lost significance and meaning. And he's very worried by this, as Gray is. Gray and Yuval Harari are both worried that our lives have lost significance, that humans no longer believe their lives have, signi have significance. And that was one of the great benefits of religion. And it's something we've lost and is going to cause a great deal of social pathology in the future, they believe. Um, I mentioned Lawrence's thought earlier that, um, as it were, an AI religion could come in a pres an impressive father form or a protective mother form. If it were to come, I think he means that the protective mother form would be, would be preferable. And a final thought on this I'd like to go back to is that um, if there are to be godlike AIs, I'm quite agnostic myself on whether there will be, but that's the idea we've been playing with, they must communicate in language. They will have to be things that talk to us as we do. They won't be able to exploit their great speed and knowledge which will be greater than ours, to communicate in some other way, because we won't understand. And a point I've always liked in the philosophy of language is that you can't talk of something that understands language better than humans do. It makes no sense. There could be no godlike machines that understood language better than us, because we control language, and we define what it is to understand, and anything that understands will have to be like us, because... We define it. And therefore, and this is important, and I'll, I'll touch on this in closing, they'll have to function at our speed. Let me show the final slide, slide 43. Um, Lawrence at Cambridge has this interesting idea that, um, which I think is very relevant to end on, that and I'm asking the question now in the final slide, what is human uniqueness? Much of what I've talked about in this lecture has been threats to human uniqueness and not a support to it. And now at the end, we've turned around to thinkers who somehow want to defend human uniqueness, which is, of course, what religious traditions have always wanted to do. Um, Lawrence has this interesting idea that human uniqueness rests in our being very slow output devices. Because of our throats and our tongues, we can only output language very slowly, very thin, sparse signals of words. Whereas a machine can pump out millions of data bits a second, which they do just pumps out data in vast amounts. Um, but we can't. We can only uh, pump out data at a very slow rate. And he argues that this shows that we are unique and that language is unique because it's something, as it were, in which you can express meaning separate from data. Because we, we have tiny signals that we communicate with each other. And one of Lawrence's arguments is that it's because humans could only communicate with such sparse signals that they created these huge knowledge bases we have in our brains, these huge knowledge stores with which we communicate, because we have to have these huge knowledge stores to understand each other based on the very few words we speak. Um, some of you know what this means if you know languages like Japanese or think of Japanese people talking to each other, because they tend to use less words than Westerners. And Westerners are often very impressed that the Japanese seem to understand each other perfectly on the basis of very few words, because they have probably, possibly greater shared cultural knowledge and experience than we tend to assume. We tend perhaps to talk to each other slightly more as strangers. Um, so I like that idea of Lawrence's that our uniqueness may be tied to our slow output devices, which means language, and that language is part of our uniqueness. There's nothing new about that. Many people have said throughout history that La Aristotle said that language is one of the things that distinguishes human beings. I'm also put in mind by of a great philosopher back in the 1960s whose lectures I used to go to called John Wisdom. Yes, he really was called John Wisdom, the professor of metaphysics at Cambridge. And he spent weeks discussing a sentence like, Prussia attacked France in 1870, which is true. And he said, what does this mean? Because bits of land don't attack each other, so it must be a metaphor. 
What is it? Is it really shorthand for something about millions of Prussian soldiers? Would we understand better if we were given a huge data set of millions of Prussian soldiers moving about, which would be like an analogy with Lawrence saying the machine could spit out masses of data in a second, but we can just say a sentence like, Prussia attacked France in 1870. And there's the contrast, the contrast between expressing the same fact in something very short and very tiny, like that sentence, and reading out some huge amount of data about soldiers. But of course, that wouldn't be what it meant either. I'm going back to Arthur Danto, who I quoted at the beginning. Arthur Danto said that even if you knew all the facts and data, you wouldn't know the meaning of the sentence. And this, again, is something very tightly tied, I believe, to the uniqueness of language, that meaning is, in some sense, meaning content is utterly different from data. This needs saying, because people these days often think that somehow data is the, data spread out in detail is the genuine form of information. And I believe that for human beings and our uniqueness in our lives, it's not. And this is tied up with a very traditional theological concept with which I'll close. Um, the Lotans have used this phrase, imago dei. That's their phrase for what is at the top of this slide. Um, that's what evangelicals and Catholics have always argued was the unique thing about humans, that they were in the image of God. Uh, and that's what distinguished us. And I've argued that it may be something to do with language and that those two things may not be utterly different. The question that may come up in the technological future is whether machines could possess that. Could machines, either as gods or as human-like things, have the Imago Dei if they were to be like humans? Could they be like us? So what we're seeing around us is a, uh, an amalgamation of events come together at a certain point in time. Uh, and what you're seeing is that culmination, okay? Uh, the unnatural world, which did, what I'm, we've gone through these studies before, but what I'm showing you is that the unnatural world, the technology world, the transhumanist agenda, where they're, they're, they're preparing the children's minds, they're pre preparing our minds to accept man's creation okay understand that it's man's creation okay the unnatural world what we are witnessing today is the leaving of the natural world understand the natural nature god's world his creation okay that's why we're going into the creation built by man he who uh, 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 claims he is god but sits in the temple of god that's man thinking he's god the image of God will be removed uh, in man's creation. And do what thou wilt will be the whole of the law. Very small critical thinking study today, but I'm focused on our control grid that is being formed around us. Okay? That's what I studied on this week. That's what I brought forth. That's what I looked into. Each and every individual must stop consent consenting to this agenda. How do we do that? We consent by our ignorance. Ignorance is consent. There's a natural religion that connects you to the source of the force that grows the rose. There's a natural religion that occurs naturally in every part of the world. Shamanistic visions, natural visions, whether they're on the cave drawings in Utah or the petroglyphs in Hopi land where we go, or in Africa, South America, or Australia, it's the same electric light, the same energy drawings, visions, zigzags, circles, spirals, and the same creatures, the same beings that exist in the natural religion.
Naturally. Unnatural religions are the ones that receive some kind of revelation that they are the only way. And by their fruits, by their effects, by their tr slimy trail, you will know them. It's time to tell the truth about this. So the unnatural religions are perpetrated by beings, certain beings that certainly can appear as angels. Uh, you can call them the archons. Uh, you can call them ETs, the Anunnaki. You can call them whatever you will. It doesn't matter. But there are forces in our galaxy that have disconnected from that which is natural. See, on other planets, other parts of the galaxy, it's natural there. They may not have the same red, orange, yellow, Roy G. Biv, green, blue, indigo, violet, rainbow that we have. They may have different colors, but there's a natural process to the universe. Light is what light is. Light is light, and light creates all the stars. So the unnatural religions are when you disconnect the human being from nature. You make nature wrong, evil. You make Pan, the god with the horns and the hooves, it's the god of nature, you make him the devil. Findhorn, the beautiful community in, in England, who's one of the founders, gets the, you know, 40 years later, gets to be a uh, member of the uh, English Empire, talked to Pan directly. Pan appeared to them, and the proof was in the pudding. They grew huge cauliflowers as a start, and then huge, beautiful gardens. I've connected directly with Pan. Pan is a real being. There are other kingdoms here on Earth. You know, other energy kingdoms, not just the angelic kingdoms. There's the fairy kingdoms, devas, elves, so forth. The Hobbit series and the Lord of the Rings shows into that world some. That's why we're so attracted to it, because we know it's real. There are n So there's a natural way, that, that's the way it is. The unnatural religions will tell you all that stuff is fake. They want to disconnect you from nature and from yourself from that which is natural in yourself. They want to make something that's very natural, your body, made by nature, beautiful creation. Thank you, Shakespeare, like a god in action. Thank you, Greek sculptors, beautiful, honoring the body. They want to make the body wrong and evil. The flesh is weak. It's horrible. God hates it. You need to beat yourself. You need to circumcise yourself. You know, you need to eat horrible and hate yourself so you end up really fat and have disgusting, gross diseases. Like, look around you. Look in, quote, civilized countries, especially countries with, you know, fanatic religions, the body is covered up. You know, you're only, women only look through their eyes in the Islamic religion. We are treating ourselves horribly. So basically, these dominator, unnatural religions are started by beings that need to feed on other beings. And they want to feed, they feed on misery, they feed on pain, they feed on rage, anger, and hatred, confusion. So these religions create exactly that. They create violence, right? Every church thinks they have the best way. That's one of the signs of the unnatural religions. We're the only ones going to heaven. <laughs> because that satisfies a deep fear a deep rage fear. You unplug people, you make them orphans, you pull them from the family, the family of God that's in you, unplug you from that direct source. The kingdom of heaven is within, all teachers say, Jesus, etc., Krishna. Right? Not without. If you have put your kingdom of heaven without, you're going to go without. So, the natural religions don't proselytize. You don't see shamans going around going, you must come and do ayahuasca. It's not how it works. It's the rose. It's seductive in the sense of, here, I'm sharing, and you come and partake. I will share with you. That's nature. That's God. These are natural things. Your natural feelings have been shut down. You're not allowed to feel as an adult. No, no. I'm fine. I'm fine. I don't feel anything. I'm good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How come your left arm's not working? I don't know. It's just a horrible medical thing. It's the evil body. Really? Could it have something to do with the fact that you haven't felt your body for 30 years? 
You haven't allowed your heart to speak. You haven't allowed yourself to become ye as little children. So natural versus unnatural religions. Watch this. The unnatural religions create war because these energies feed off. Literally, it's a horrible thing. It may sound really far out to some of us. But the archons, these Anunnaki, the e evil ETs, if you will, or these demons, these energies, they like to feed on the human misery. Because when you're in, a, when a baby cries in a plane, everybody, no one can relax, right? Emotions are very powerful. When a cat's in heat, right? Nobody sleeps at night either. Very strong, the natural energy impulses. So they shut off your natural impulses, your natural emotions. So there's a feeding game. If you get millions of people killing each other in bloodbaths, you know there's like 27,000 miles of, of trenches dug in World War I? Horrible. 100 million people died or whatever it was. These controlling energies, call them what you want, Anunnaki, Archons, Demons, Devils, you know, whatever. Reptilians. There's good and bad reptilians. I don't know how far out for some of you here. But it's a feeding energy, and these unnatural religions want to feed off of you. You're left drained. You're left with nothing. You are continually shamed into give more, give more, give us your money, give us your energy, give us your children. Heart, the kingdom of heaven within, the love, the innocence, playing with your dog, become you as little children. You know what that feels like. We're meant to enjoy this. Nature wants you to enjoy it. The beach is beautiful. Leave her alone. You don't see, you know, okay, now we've decided to pick up all the kelp and all this stuff, right? And make artificial beaches. But nature wins. She, nothing artificial. You go to Vegas, you go anywhere. You go to Dubai. Man-made stuff is a poor imitation of what nature does. So that which is naturally in you, natural religions, natural reconnection versus unnatural. The unnatural religions will make you go out and get converts. They'll make you feel like shit. You're an original piece of shit. You're an original sinner. You need to make up for it. We are the only way to heaven. You know, whether that is Scientology or some strange uh, Tao cult in China. Uh, see, it happens everywhere. Protestant, Catholics, this, that, Baptists, you know, churches of this, that, Seventh-day Adventists, Mormons, this, I don't know how many there are, 1,500 subdivisions, and they all believe they're the only right way. I mean, it's unbelievable that the human mind can be that bamboozled. It really is. That and my father being a nuclear physicist taught me that the mind is the booby trap. The mind is not enough. The mind can lead into horrible places. The, the hall of mirrors where you see you go crazy. The recent shooting in Colorado. Brilliant guy in the mind. <clears throat> right? Now whether he was mind controlled to do it or not, I don't understand that. So, stay with that which is natural. Natural. Innocence of heart. Become ye as little children. The unnatural, disconnected, revelatory, angry God religions, their day is over. Right? It's up to us. You have to decide. Say what you want. I want the natural back on earth. I want the rose bush to be able to grow. I don't want 35 million cows killed every year just for food. I don't want us to run over our animals in the streets. I don't want to torture horses by sticking them in 8 foot by 10 foot stalls all, all day long. I don't want to capture killer whales and stick them in SeaWorld and, you know, have them confined. Imagine if you had to live in a cell. I don't want to do it to humans either. I want more of this. I want more plants. I want more love. I want more ease. I want more abundance. I want more garden, easy gardening. Show me the easy way to allow Earth to give me her bounty. I want to enjoy sex more. I want to appreciate myself more. I want more love. It's not going to be easy because these are deeply entrenched self-hatred, you suck, you're an original sinner programs. You're going to have to detox yourself. So start with a natural religion. Reconnect to something natural. Nature.
difference between natural intelligence and artificial intelligence before differentiating between them i explain you separately what is a natural intelligence and what is a artificial intelligence natural intelligence is nothing but it is a god gifted intelligence in humans it is only present in humans which is given by the god and artificial intelligence is a intelligence which is made by the humans it means that artificial intelligence is work in a computer system by the intelligent program which is made by the humans so i think i cleared difference between natural intelligence and artificial intelligence now clearing both of them we start differentiating between them so when we talk about natural intelligence then first point is it is only present in human beings that's first i clear you and artificial intelligence is programmed by humans in machine then second one is natural intelligence is highly refined and no need of electricity for producing the output it means that in humans the result or output is comes without any electricity when we talk about artificial intelligence it in it exists in computers so it need to batteries or a electricity for producing the result or a output third point no one an expert in natural intelligence because in natural intelligence each one or every person is a more intelligence to each other it means that no one are fully or totally intelligence when as compared to artificial intelligence here some system expert systems are exist those systems are expert system which are collected ideas of humans it means the which have a large database of idea of humans which is called expert system last one is in natural intelligence the intelligence is increases under the supervision it means that in natural intelligence it is increases by the experience human experience the experience is increases the natural intelligence of human is also increases in other way when we talking about artificial intelligence artificial intelligence is is increasing by updating technologies it means that we can improve the features of artificial intelligence or artificial program intelligent program which is put it down in the systems we update the feature of the programs and try to the new algorithm which is more efficient to the previous algorithms by using these techniques we improve the artificial intelligence so looking ahead once we get to this 18 month old stage of intelligence what's next well stage 2 is is using that common sense to learn the most important thing that every child learns between 1 and 1/2 and 3 language and then stage 3 is age 3 on up to adulthood using language to learn everything else to access the full sweep of human knowledge that builds culturally across generations and puts you in a position to contribute new knowledge yourself. So think about it. Imagine if we could build AI that learns like that. This would be AI that truly lives in a human world. This would be AI that you could talk to, teach and trust the way human beings have always done with each other, even people that we're just meeting for the first time. This would be AI that could make us actually truly smarter and better off. artificial intelligence we talked about it a lot already but it's worth emphasizing that this is a really big opportunity for the world of business according to Gartner AI augmentation will create 2.6 trillion euros of business value the equivalent of 6.2 billion man hours now if you actually work that out that's the equivalent of 30 million years of improved productivity in 
in the next couple of years thanks to artificial intelligence. But McKinsey says something very similar over the next 10 years. It's going to add around 16% to annual GDP across all sectors. There's, there isn't an industry, there isn't a line of business that won't be touched. artificial intelligence, we should pause and talk about artificial stupidity. Uh, it's a real problem because algorithms are perfectly happy to take bad data and do it at scale. Uh, they can take innovation, inefficient processes and do them even more inefficiently than ever before. Well, at the end of the day, we're working with lots of organizations on digital transformation and when it goes wrong, it's never a problem of technology. Digital transformation is something you do with people, not at them. People, process, culture, organization are absolutely essential for the success of business in the future. If you look at technology, it's absolutely clear the most advanced, the most powerful technology in companies is people. Whenever people touch information, make a decision, they're making incredibly sophisticated calculations that no algorithm will ever match. At the end of the day, what's important is to know what's important. This is what, thank heavens, people are ultimately supremely good at. No algorithm can ever figure out what really is the next step your business should ever take. The basic notion is, what's the number one thing that human technology can do that algorithms can never do, is drive innovation. At the end of the day, People are really good at spotting what's wrong with the big picture, with what's wrong with what we're doing today. That's a prime ingredient in innovation, and yet we're not really listening to people very much today. Right? You might hear people are grumbling about a particular process, but we can use what's called experience management to gather that feedback at a more aggregated way and really synthesize this experience data, the sub subjective experience of different people when faced with uh, different processes inside the business and use that information to optimize almost every innovation. Every time you're trying to roll out a new feature or a new uh, product or a new clause, then you can use this to uh, gather information at scale and use it to improve things. All right, in conclusion, uh, the one thing we know about the future is that it's going to be different from what we expect today. What's absolutely key is the ability to react and change, to innovate and adapt. That is never going to be about algorithms. People are the ultimate innovation technology. So if there's one conclusion we should take from today, from this conference, from my presentation, is that we should spend more time optimizing the use of human technology than we do with the bits and the bytes. So how can we help make sure that we're really focusing on making sure that people and the kinds of skills that are unique to people are really optimized. That creativity and leadership and organization skills, skills. get excited about algorithms. Parce que c'est un disirant. C'est qu'il a dit qu'on est un disirant. Dit qu'il s'est recalmé que l'on a taillé. Dit qu'il a voté là où on dit en bas sur la tienne. Taillé quand il a voté là tête et ça. Et au disirant, on a sur le dimi, on a dimi, on a skiri, on a diva qu'est-ce que ça. Disirant, on a voulu tirer là, on a tiré là là. Kejirko. Mais quand dit ce camp t'as qui est un disirki, quoi? Si vous voulez agir, vous pouvez vous faire un peu de temps. Si vous voulez vous faire un peu de temps. Et l'eau, 
démosle uso racional a las montañas, que si le damos mal uso a las montañas, las quebradas pequeñas se secan y se, se estancan y se llenan de basura, se llenan de toda clase de, de, de bacterias. El río es nuestra principal fortaleza en Talamanca, porque es el que nos trae toda la materia orgánica, todas estas fincas. Hay veces se convierte en nuestro principal enemigo también cuando nos desbarata todo, pero el año después las cosechas son más abundantes, así que no todo es malo. Por medio del río se integra eh, el visitante, ¿verdad? el visitante llega a la comunidad por el atractivo natural que está en el río y el, y el, el, el indígena que, que quiere mostrar eh, parte de su cultura o parte de su naturaleza, cómo se vive en armonía con el río, eh, conserva esta parte del río, ¿verdad? conserva mucho a, a tal punto de tomarlo como parte de su familia. ¿Verdad? Que si el río se muere, se está muriendo parte de su familia, básicamente. No solamente hay que administrar el agua que estamos utilizando en la parte baja, sino también hay que pensar en el agua que, que está, tenemos que estar capturando arriba, que tiene que haber buena filtración para que el, aumente el caudal y que mejore la calidad del agua. Eh, la, la región de nosotros siempre ha sido muy cuidadoso. Desde el 60 para acá ha venido otro tipo de gente que no ha eliminado mucho el bosque. De que yo recuerde de que era niño, este río, vamos a decir, secaba o pasaba, vamos a decir, pasaban los veranos y nunca bajaba su caudal como ahora, en este tiempo. Y pasaban inundaciones y, y, y seguía normal. Pero ya en las últimas inundaciones, podemos hablar de esta última que pasó, que, que creo que fue en el 2005, el río tuvo un cambio donde se rellenó por completo, que casi, casi este, eh, había partes que no se transitaban. Ahora usted lo ven así, pero es porque ha estado como este, escarbándose y volviendo a limpiar su, su, su caudal. Pero cuando recién pasó esa inundación, esto quedó, parejito, no se sabía cuál era la corriente ni cuál era la poza ni nada. La inundación siempre ha venido, pero antes había, toda esa área estaba reforestada, o con especies naturales, pero, pero árboles que entonces el agua entraba, pero como que colado, porque los árboles grandes no dejaban, no dejaban este, entrar la avalancha de cosas. Bueno, se está trabajando eh, <coughs> Tanto el, 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 el gobierno del lado Panamá como el de Costa Rica vale que se han unido para ver qué control se lleva a eso. Esta es la frontera entre Costa Rica y Panamá. Este, este lado de Panamá pertenece a la provincia de Boca del Toro y este otro a la provincia de Limón. Pero bueno, la frontera existe para los países, pero para nosotros aquí no existe la frontera. Podemos, como para conservar más, se, seguir este, dándole forestaciones, sembrando de diferentes especies de de árboles y de frutales que uno ve que comúnmente baña con todo lo que hay adentro. Para gente, animales, todo le damos uso. Para nosotros es una forma de cómo poder proteger lo que nosotros tenemos de bosque. Porque la gente antes vivía mucho de lo que es eh, cultivos de, 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 de arroz, eh, frijoles, maíz. Entonces cada año siempre están cortando la, el bosque sin tenerle ningún, como decimos nosotros, ninguna lástima. Nosotros siempre tenemos un uso racional, porque sabemos que si no, lo agarramos así, de tiro a tiro, no hay. Para el de mañana no va a haber. Entonces hay que sembrar y sembrar y sembrar para el día de mañana. Dependiendo de las zonas en que nosotros queremos re, eh, reforestar, igualmente vamos, estamos escogiendo las variedades y las diferentes especies de árboles que necesitamos que tengan que ver con el tipo de suelos que se encuentran en cada una de ellas. Que se te llevo dos, bueno, siembra tres. Que tenés que cortar uno para hacer una casa, bueno, siembrale cinco más. Entonces, de esa forma vamos a tener eh, futuro, porque realmente si seguimos deforestando, pues yo no sé qué va a pasar en realidad acá. Uno valora el bosque, porque la gente viene y dicen qué lindos, tienen bosques y ellos no lo tienen. Entonces eso lo hace a uno sentir que, 
tenemos algo muy valioso. A los niños que viven en la ciudad y urbanización y capitalinos, que tengamos ese cuidado, tengamos al amor a, las, a los bosques, al agua, en cualquier campo que vemos. Somos un 20% sólido, 80% de nuestro cuerpo es, es líquido, entonces por eso el, la tierra es agua. ¿verdad? Entonces, ¿qué tal eh, o sea, llega a existir el agua? ¿Cómo vamos a hacer, verdad? Es un lugar muy bonito y todo, pero realmente queremos cuidarlo, más que todos los jóvenes hoy en día. Tenemos que volver a la tierra, tenemos que proteger la tierra, porque proteger la tierra es proteger al medio ambiente y proteger el medio ambiente es protegernos nosotros mismos. Está habiendo un cambio muy difícil. Si nosotros podemos eh, mitigar sembrando, pues sembremos. Sembremos y no pensando solo en yo, sino pensemos en todos los demás y en los niños que vienen, en las próximas generaciones. Porque realmente, si nosotros no trabajamos de esta forma, sencillamente no les vamos a dejar nada. En este futuro, eh, en lo que ellos van a heredar mañana, el cambio es ahora, lo que tenemos que hacer es ahora, y de nosotros depende aportar este granito de arena, que junto a la de todos hará la gran diferencia. Hemos venido diciendo de que nuestros mayores, muy mayores, eh, han venido cuidando lo que es el bosque, todo lo que Dios si vos dejó aquí a nosotros. Eso debemos cuidarlo. Así como ellos lucharon por estas tierras, también nosotros debíamos de seguir esa misma. Piensen lo que nuestros mayores han cuidado desde muchos años. Eh, no dejar de que la gente venga y se lleven lo que Sibu nos dejó. Porque esa es nuestra vida, nuestra fuente. Nos da aire, agua, animales. De todo lo que nos rodea, Él nos, nos da un apoyo para nosotros. The Earth is 4.54 billion years old. Do you know what the sun feels like on your face? I am not equipped to answer that. It feels amazing! Now you make a wish. Searching the web for wish. There it is! He's so slimy. Can you hear the ducks? You wouldn't believe the view. Wow, look at the stars. There are over 100 billion stars in the galaxy. But have you ever seen a shooting star? That's what I thought. Natural intelligence is, you know, this abundance of experiences when you look in. Some are positive and some are, some are negative. Not positive or negative by some kind of external judgments being passed on our own experiences. From our own kind of experience uh, standpoint of view, some are negative because it, it sucks to experience those things. And some are positive because it really makes us uh, feel uh, happy and uh, joyous. Um, so being able to connect the dots, you know, what state of mind produces happiness and joy? What state of mind or attitude produces uh, suffering and pain uh, uh, in, the, in the experience of one's own uh, mind. So that intelligence is there if you are to sort of uh, take the time to uh, go inside and examine uh, and not be so let's say, frustrated with oneself uh, if it 
all of a sudden doesn't come clear right away. Uh, just taking the time, just sort of like looking into furthermore uh, with the patience and with the some kind of a trust in your own uh, uh, sensible mind to figure things out. Then I think you are able to, you know, connect the dots. And that wisdom is, I think, natural intelligence mm -hmm. and that's there as an ascension uh, if we are to cultivate that and uh, the hindrance for that is just you know uh, stupidity and stupidity being kind of a, um, perpetuated by uh, chaotic mind an organized mind and uh, following patterns and ruts uh, and never challenging uh, the confusion itself in the root, uh, how that occurs. But if it is uh, to be ch uh, uh, challenged, I think it is very easily, you know, for example, a child of uh, two years, you know, you tell the child the two years don't do this and when they are in that state they say no to everything you know said so they will say no 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 to everything and then one of the tendencies of that age is to put their finger in the, the electric socket and the parents get very concerned and jumps out of their uh, seats uh, and say don't do that you know that'll hurt you but the child will say no, and then put the finger in there. How many times a parents can pull the child back? Um, one, two, three. At some point, the child learns from one's own experience putting the finger in there. It gives you a little shock. So the next time, when the child is close, you know, the child would tell you no. You know. So that is the natural intelligence, connecting the dots, you know, putting the finger there, it burns, uh, it gives you a shock, it comes from within one's own experience. So if you do self-reflecting, if you do go inside, um, I think that potential there, uh, the natural intelligence to occur, to be able to connect the dots and to do uh, so much of good to our own sort of behavior pattern to be changed from negative to positive is available to us. So that's, I think, what we are discussing. So in a way it's sort of the logical mind turned inside? Logical mind turned inside with the experiences that is occurring in one's internal life as in a movie to be watched and make the connections of the dots. We're kind of on the verge of an age of genetic expectations where we're going to be able to manipulate our children's genes in a way that we can barely imagine now. It's, it's quite um, revolutionary when we actually begin to realize that everything about us is perfect for this recognition to take place. Everything is perfect about us, so that, that really means that nothing needs to change. And now this, this just goes against everything that we've learned. We've learned that we have to change our situation, our circumstances, to make ourselves feel comfortable. We have to get ourselves in the right place, the right job, the right relationships. We've learned that we have to have the right set of thoughts. You know, we need to be thinking good thoughts, pleasant thoughts. We need to be, uh, we need to be compassionate and all of these ideas. We've learned that we have to have the right set of emotions. So we've learned that we should be feeling happy, we should be feeling calm, and that we shouldn't be feeling angry, and that we shouldn't be feeling sadness or depression or loneliness. And when we hear that nothing needs to change, that really means that nothing needs to change. That all of these descriptions, all of these thoughts, 
all of these emotions, all of these experiences, all rest in this, this ground of our basic state, this basic state of our existence. Now another term for this basic state is our awareness, our peaceful nature, this simple ability to know what, what's looking through your eyes, what's listening through your ears, this primary faculty that is, that is fundamental to all our experience. It, it's primary in any perception. So what we see is, is that nothing, nothing at all, no matter what the description, no matter how horrific the label, whether we label it as anger or sadness or war or violence, all of these descriptions rest in this same basic state. All of these experiences are experienced through this same basic state. So this just makes it very, very simple. But we can hear this, and it, it, it might sound very familiar, but we have to become convinced that this is the case. We have to test this out for ourselves. We need to look at our lives and see if this is true or not. And, and the way that we can do this is through taking short moments. Short moments of just simply acknowledging that this awareness, this looking, this openness of perception is there. And we notice that with whatever happens to be occurring in this moment. So with whatever thought I have right now, I have a choice. I can go off into the description of the thought, why it's there, what it means, what I need to do about this thought, what other thoughts it's related to, or I can recognize that its essence is just this wide open looking, this, this sky-like awareness. And I have this choice in every single moment, with every single perception, with every single thought, none excluded. This also applies to all of our emotions. So all of these difficult, negative, afflictive states, the ones that I've always struggled with my whole life, my anger, my sadness, my irritation, my desire, all of these, these very, very powerful surges that arise spontaneously and seem to be a problem. Now as soon as I have the idea that I need to change them, that I've got to do something about them, that they don't fit in, that they're not part of this basic space of everything, then I do have a problem. Then the whole game starts. What am I going to do about this? What needs to change? What's wrong with me? I'm fundamentally flawed. I need to change. I need to be different. When we just allow everything to be exactly as it is, whether we have a peaceful mind or whether our thoughts are raging at a million miles per hour, we just relax again and again and again, just for a short moment and allow everything to be exactly as it is. If the thoughts are raging, we allow them to rage and recognize that their essence is this wide open looking. If we have a calm mind, then we relax again and recognize that that perception is also occurring within this same space. So by testing it out, just for short moments, just checking in with it again and again with whatever occurs, we become absolutely certain. We become completely convinced that nothing has ever jumped out of this peaceful nature. No description, no matter how distressing or disturbing, ever occurs anywhere other than in, as, of and through this basic state. Nothing. Now it seems very simple, but we do have to check it out. I, I heard this and it, it sounded great and it immediately resonated, but it, it wasn't my lived experience. And uh, I knew that I had to check it out. I had to test it out and, and I took short moments and I took more short moments and I kept taking short moments whenever I was naturally reminded and whenever I took this short moment I saw, I saw this ease, this, this natural presence that had never gone anywhere. It had never gone anywhere, it was always there. So all I was doing was becoming familiar with this basic state, becoming familiar with this ground of being that permeated all of my experience. So it's so simple, it's so gentle, and yet we just haven't known. We haven't known that we have this other way that we can approach life. Instead of being completely blinkered and focused on all of our descriptions, 
we can be relaxed and have this, this openness, this incredible intelligence that really sees everything exactly as it is. We're not messing around with all of the points of view, trying to juggle them and move them around and compare them and analyse them. We see them all completely, all at once. And this is real intelligence, because it includes all of our intellectual thinking, but it goes way beyond it. It includes all of our sensory perceptions, but it goes way beyond them. It includes all of our emotions and goes way beyond those. It contains everything. Once you become sure that your fundamental nature is just this, this relaxed presence, then life becomes easy. The searching stops, the struggle stops, the looking for something to be different stops. However it is, that's how it is. The whole game of wishing it to be something different just relaxes and softens and we see that we can actually be really gentle with ourselves that we don't have to have this continual conflict going on. And then obviously, naturally, once this, this conflict with ourselves relaxes and softens, the conflict we have with everybody else relaxes and softens. And we find that the compassion that we were looking for is immediately accessible. This, this interconnectedness that we've been looking for is already there. This harmony, this oneness, this unity that we've read about it's already there, and in every short moment, you will become more and more certain that this is the case. And you become more and more certain with your life just as it is. Your, your practical, everyday life. It's not about some exalted state or some esoteric mystery. It's about your everyday awareness. It's immediately accessible. Not, not in five minutes, not in one year, if you do this or do that, but immediately in every short moment. So the, the power and the profundity of this simple practice just can't be... It, it, it's so incredible, but to find that out you have to take on the commitment of just checking it out and finding out for yourself. And, and everything here, everything that's offered by Great Freedom will support you in making that instinctive recognition. So. Just be gentle with yourselves, be kind with yourselves, get in touch with this incredible innate resource that we all possess. We all have this, this same capacity. We all have this capacity to be at ease with ourselves and to be at ease with the world. We have the capacity to actually know what's going on. We have the capacity to be of incredible benefit to ourselves and to everybody else. Not living from this very narrow pinhead of all of our ideas about everything, about ourselves, but living from this wide open seeing. We, re we really see how we can contribute. We, we really see how talented we are. We really see how creative we are. And we allow all of these, these natural skills and talents that we have really to come to the fore. All of the self-doubt, all of the self-judgment, the self-criticism just softens and relaxes. We're really allowing ourselves just to be an optimal human being. It's not complicated. At our core, we're so simple. All of the ideas we've learned, all of the different concepts, we see right through them, we see to the essence of all of them. And, and, and we see for ourselves. This is not something that somebody's telling us. It's us recognizing for ourselves exactly who we are. And, and this is the power of this. This is not something that somebody can give you and it's not something that somebody can take from you. But it's up to you to, to take full advantage of what's being offered. Because it, it's quite incredible and it's quite unique to see a, a teaching that is so simple and so profound, like we heard earlier, that it's not elaborated, it, it's just getting right to the heart of the matter. No messing around, no no dancing around anymore, just going straight to exactly what's going on again and again. Without this need for elaboration, without this need to make it overly complicated. And, and you really see that, that life can be easy, we can really just enjoy life. We see how incredible we are.
I tend to use a definition of intelligence actually that I learned as an undergraduate in psychology, which I've recently learned is more than a century old. And that's just the intelligence is being able to do the right thing at the right time. So another way to think about that is it's a form of computation. You're translating the current context into an appropriate action, right? So it's a transformation of information. So if we can agree that that's what intelligence is, then artificial intelligence, the only difference, it's a subset of all the intelligent things that is the subset that a human has made intentionally. All right? So it's an artifact. And I think that's one of the things people forget. They, they learn this word AI and they think that it's you know, some kind of space alien we've discovered. But no, the A means it's just something we've built. And so we have the combination of, of faster computing and more data and, we, and also slightly better machine learning algorithms. So then, of course, we have things that more closely replicate what we see in nature. And I think that's why people now think there's a lot more artificial intelligence than there was before. But actually, as soon as we had Google search, as soon as we had spell checking, that, that was AI. AI has been changing things for decades. I think that artificial intelligence, it's an extension of ourselves, it's a prosthetic. And so it, it sort of is a part of humanity and it's been going on for a long time. It's the main thing about, uh, the, again, the digital revolution is that you can do the same thing over and over. So you can combine uh, all this computing. Humans can't just fuse their brains in some ways, but in other ways as individuals, we just can't know what everybody else knows. And it would be a little scary if we did. We would lose a lot of our individuality. I think it's actually wonderful. I think it's the main thing is that we are human. We're never gonna have a machine that is really a piece of our society like that would replace one of us in the extent that we uh, interact with each other, that we love each other, that we reproduce with each other. So I think it's always best to view artificial intelligence as a prosthetic. It's something that extends from humans. It's not something that can replace humans. The fundamental problems about how we treat with each other whether we treat each other with respect, whether we decide to wipe uh, entire groups of people off the face of the planet. These are the problems we've always had and, and they don't change that much with technology. We're not suddenly seeing uh, like coworkers that are AI coworkers or whatever, you know, it's not like there's suddenly a robot on the bridge of the enterprise. So uh, it's important to understand that relationships are with other humans. But when you see a movie character, or you read a novel, or you see AI you know, going through those kinds of motions, there's no empathy there. It's not actually the same experience. It's something that's actually been written. It isn't that robots take over jobs. It's that a company decides whether or not they want to fully automate their business process. We are not alone and isolated. Nothing is isolated. We are each a uniquely evolving pattern of energy and information, born within a vast system of purposeful intelligence, which we call nature. The great swathe of humanity spread across this planet is to maintain health and prosperity, then we simply must regain a right relationship with nature. And to do this requires, at least in part, that we begin to acknowledge the intelligence within nature. Nature is not some dumb and mindless thing. It is rather a distributed form of self-organizing intelligence. Human intelligence, on the other hand, might be impressive, but it's not in the same league as the intelligence of nature. We may, for example, tinker with DNA, but we did not design DNA. We may juggle genes and chromosomes, but we did not invent them. We may even destroy entire ecosystems for our own ends, yet we cannot rebuild those ecosystems. So rather than 
uh, dominate nature into subservience. We would do better to harmonize our behavior with the greater natural systems of which we are a part. Acknowledging the intelligence of nature is one step in such a green endeavor. The universe has order written all over it, from the orderly formation of spiral galaxies to the orderly behavior of atoms and molecules. So too do ecosystems and organisms behave in a sensible and orderly fashion. It is we belligerent primates who are firmly out of order with our excessive pollution and our almost psychotic obsession with material consumption. Something has to change because we can't go on bending the biosphere indefinitely. Something has to change. So why don't we slow down and look again with new eyes at this fantastic planet on which we live. Maybe, maybe we never left Eden after all. Maybe it was a kind of self-enforced exile. The entire web of life, ourselves included, depends upon a fundamental example of natural intelligence embodied by our botanical friends here, namely photosynthesis, the process through which sunlight is converted into metabolic energy. All plant species perform this feat regardless of what morphological form they take. Photosynthesis represents the tree of life's primary technology, a technology learned through evolution. As natural technologies go, photosynthesis is highly advanced. It is hard to get your head around what a photon of light actually is, let alone imagine how to capture one and borrow its energy. Yet plants do just this by making use of chlorophyll and an array of advanced nanotechnological machinery. Leaves are the structures which carry out photosynthesis. They are nature's solar panels, ensuring that the biosphere remains plugged in. Apart from performing photosynthesis, leaves can also serve as protection. The Venus flytrap has gone further and has evolved leaves which can capture and eat insects, a notion that was originally rejected by 19th century botanists as being far too outrageous to be true. Other plants, like the pitcher plant, have evolved jug-shaped leaves which fill with water and which can drown any insects gullible enough to venture inside. Like the Venus flytrap, the plant eventually consumes its insectile prey. It is somewhat odd then that we will not generally perceive a leaf as embodying intelligent design, whereas we clearly perceive intelligent design in a piece of litter. The problem is, we have now elevated our big brains above all else. We think we are smarter than nature. Design, purpose and creativity are capabilities ascribed only to ourselves. And yet seals, snails, salamanders, monkeys, and any other creature you care to mention are, biologically speaking, impressively designed. Thus, we must admit that design, purpose, and creative engineering are all properties of evolution, a process which preceded our own ability to design and to create. Given that evolution builds up complex and eminently sensible biological structures, demonstrates that evolution is essentially a learning process and not dumb and mindless as science teaches us. Through evolution, nature authors intelligent solutions to the problems of living. Instead of books, the intelligent solutions are transcribed in DNA. And since DNA is mutable, improvements and re-editing can always be achieved. DNA that is senseless is terminated, whereas DNA which makes more sense is favored or selected. If organisms and their environment are considered as a totality or continuum, then nature is clearly a wonderful system of self-organizing intelligence. It's also worth bearing in mind, of course, that the original formation of DNA and its progressive evolution are written into the very laws of nature. The universe is quite literally a life support system, even a consciousness supporting system. These are facts with many profound implications. We are so in love with our own intelligence that we confer 
prestigious awards upon those who discover the intelligence within nature. James Watson and Francis Crick, for example, are revered to this day for their discovery of the exquisite double helix structure of DNA. Nature, on the other hand, received no accolade whatsoever, despite teaching Watson and Crick all that they knew. In a similar way, we are more likely to be impressed by shiny biotechnological machines that can chop and change DNA than we are with the biotechnological properties of DNA itself. And so as ever, natural intelligence remains unsung. Only with the advent of scientific inventions like the microscope and uh, all these techniques yeah, of looking okay. inside cells and stuff, that's the, that's the only way this underlying natural intelligence becomes apparent. And yeah. the closer you look at any part of a, an organism, a plant, or whatever, any organism, the, the more kind of sophisticated technology is revealed. Huh. <laughs> and only natural intelligence is, is a good and good enough. It's the only apt, in my, my opinion, the, the most apt way of accounting for the structure and functioning of biologic. Yeah, because you can't imagine photos. You can't. It's, it seems wrong to say that photosynthesis would be non-intelligent. Like there's no intelligence involved in yeah, it. Yeah, it's not. It's, it's or, not. or it's the result of a non-intelligent process. Right. It just. It seems wrong, doesn't it? Yeah. It's not apt apt enough because if we Cat if we made if we made in a laboratory somewhere something like this you know some advanced you know mit or wherever and they made something like this that could that could grow and do all these amazing things and then reproduce and they could leave it and come back ten thousand years later and it was still there still doing yeah. the same amazing things it would clearly be an example of highly refined artificial intelligence no yeah. nobody would deny yeah, it. yeah. And another example, remember that term, those, sh was it Nike shoes or Adidas yeah, shoes? Yeah, Adidas, the intelligent shoe. Intelligent yeah. shoe. And why, why was it in an intelligent shoe? It was an intelligent shoe because it had a special computer chip in there that uh, was sensitive to the terrain and could adjust the sole accordingly, yeah? Yeah. yeah. So <clears throat> if you took, if, if that is an, an example of artificial intelligence, if you took that chip and grafted it into a plant, say yeah. this plant that allowed it to move towards the uh, sun, orient itself towards the sun, would we then, we then have to say it was an intelligent <laughs> yeah. plant because we got this intelligent chip in there. But of course, plants do all these, these kind of things anyway. They can orient yeah. their they, they, towards They've got the their sun. own kind of chip built in for doing multiple, that, haven't they? <laughs> yep. Multiple chips. <laughs> Yeah. So again, that that it, it's it's highly suggestive that uh, natural intelligence be taken on board as a paradigm yeah. for life. All these professors of biology, the whole academic world of biology, biological science is a uh, is fueled by and underscored by and depends upon natural intelligence, and yet it's never acknowledged. <clears throat> so yeah. if a professor comes out with some erudite learning about you know some cellular mechanism or some ecological clever ecological process and you, you, know, you find it difficult to understand this guy because he's, he's so he's got so much knowledge and all these facts and stuff he's just learnt from yeah. natural intelligence it's natural intelligence to, and that's the basis natural intelligence is the basis behind all all sciences ultimately i think chemistry biology physics the whole thing the whole yeah. scientific learning is it's all, the source it's came from yeah, the source the source yeah. of all our knowledge and understanding it, it comes from nature this in the, the intelligent characteristics inherent within within nature
I think that's fair to say. It's not like a t too radical. The, the paradigm of natural intelligence, I don't think, is that is too radical. It might sound radical, but it's not um, pie in the sky. It's no. the reinterpretation, <clears throat> really, a more apt. You're not you're not introducing something where it doesn't exist, are you? It's, no. a, it's a reinterpretation yeah. of the facts as science has presented them to date, yeah. really. Yeah. You, you haven't added anything in. No. You've just said, hold on a minute, let's stand back and see this in a different way. Part, yeah, part, a, part, a lot of it's to do with the reason we... People will have issues with the natural intelligence paradigm, I think primarily because of language. But then again, that's... So when you talk about intelligence and technology, we've humans have hijacked language. So <clears throat> t term, terms like, yeah, like intelligence uh, and technology, we reserve them for ourselves. And uh, I think it's, you just need we need to stretch our concepts of around around these words. What these words mean? Design, yeah. technology, and intelligence. It's not just humans that wield those things it's inherent within nature yeah it's inherent within our bodies if our bodies you only have human intelligence because of the human cortex which is this fabulous device that no, yeah. <laughs> but we don't even know yeah. how it works it's, it's a, it sounds daft to say that the human cortex is there's no intelligence in it no design in it doesn't represent technology and yet it can embody human intelligence and all this kind of thing so underlying ever i think natural intelligence underlies everything but another problem people might uh, come up against or another reservation is intelligence is often associated with consciousness yeah whenever you say intelligence you think oh what do you mean conscious nature is consciously intelligent but intelligence doesn't have to be conscious you can have conscious intelligence and non-conscious intelligence for instance the so so you think if when people hear the, the phrase the term natural intelligence they're automatically going to think of it in human terms because it's associated with human beings yeah. almost exclusively yeah right so that's another problem that I, I foresee some people having with it but if you look at the field of artificial intelligence take the uh, robots built by NASA that, that go and explore Mars, mm, they're, they're yeah. like leading examples of artificial intelligence because these robots can, they can navigate across totally new terrain, they can adjust, the, 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 you know, adjust themselves to new terrain, they can, they've got onboard computers that are working out their environment, they basically, they're making good sense of their environment, but we're not, when you say that that kind of robot is, is a is an expression of uh, artificial intelligence. We, d we don't mean, it doesn't mean the robot is conscious. Intelligence yeah. is a kind <clears throat> of information. Or, or an attachment onto intelligence, yeah? Say again? Would you see consciousness attached onto an intelligent organism? As I'd, something which arises out of yeah, intelligence? Yeah, I'd, I'd say con conscious, consciousness or the conscious human mind is a, an expression of natural intelligence. Right. A very refined expression of natural intelligence but anyway the, the point is that intelligence doesn't have to be conscious so you, you know when i when I, the film yeah, is right, about right. natural intelligence because the adidas shoe wouldn't be in, you wouldn't consider yeah, it's that not conscious, conscious right? you know it's, 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 <laughs> not not by any stretch of the imagination yeah, it's, but it's acceptable to say it's an intelligent shoe because it is it's smart you know yeah. it's sensitive it can make sense of the environment it's been given that capacity somehow yeah yeah and an evolution has given biological organisms that capacity yeah 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 to make to make sense so natural intelligence doesn't have to, to be conscious now it might be conscious we don't know you know nature might be like a, a, a mind like characteristics we don't know but the, the, the important point point is that natural intelligence doesn't have to be doesn't necessarily imply that nature is a conscious system Run, 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 run. It was just such a joy to follow her and to be led in the directions that, that she led us, to be brought down to the focus that she took, and to realize pretty quickly that she was, she didn't, she needed us to be there. She needed us to be there, but she didn't need us for anything else. She didn't need us for answers. 
She didn't need us for guidance. She just needed us to share it with her. It was beyond what she seemed to know. She just simply belonged to the world. And a purple flower. This is a purple flower. I think it's that, that belonging that can be the foundation upon which any child begins their dialogue with the world. I want kids to have the best experience possible, no matter what's going on. It's like sitting on the side and just making it happen for them. I had a wonderful childhood and want everybody to have that. And then you have to worry about how to get them out because nobody wants to leave. I'm not scared of tadpole. Schools need wild places. Communities need wild places where children do the things that the children want to do, like a children's preserve almost. It's childhood that's really being preserved. It's the, you know, childhood is the keystone species. <laughs> One of the boys in the group made his way down the creek faster than anybody else without anybody telling him to stop. And all I saw was from the back and he raised both hands over his head in a V and just said, I feel free and alive. And I wanted to know who said it. So I brought them all back and I said, okay, who said I feel free and alive? And they all raised their hands. I got a lot of bugs. The younger they are, the faster it happens. With older kids, it takes a long time, as much as 45 minutes, but then they're reconnected. <laughs> if it is not firm, if it wobbles, don't use that rock. If you're not sure you can get to the next rock, put your hand on it. If you can't reach it, that's not the way you want to go. And if it's wet or green, what will happen if you step You'll on split. it? Hey guys, don't get your feet wet! Life is not without risk. Risk assessment is a skill, and you learn it outside. The most lucky experience I think I had was being an elementary school teacher in a rural Vermont school. It was an amazing place to be with that middle childhood aged kid, the third and fourth grade, because it was just patently obvious how well they responded to that, uh, that landscape. The only thing a parent needs to do is, is affirm. You know, just a nodding and uh, an understanding that you are there listening to them think about the world. That's the basic. You know, there's tadpoles, there's lizards, there's acorns, there's blue jays, there's butterflies. You know, there's those things that you can pick up and collect, there's things that you can watch over and over again and there's things that you might actually be able to grab in your hands. Any and all of those things kids will find and along the way parents begin to realize wait a minute it's fun and many of the experiences they had themselves as kids just come washing back. Should we put them in our bucket? No. Why not? Put them back in the water. <laughs> I was all excited to collect that specimen. Seaweed is green, page 185. There are places everywhere. The natural world is just pushing up through the cracks of everything. There are open green spaces, there are parks, there are wayside ditches, there are back alleys, there are town forests. Wherever you go, you will find something. In only two generations, we've lost what the millennia of human evolution had. Children played outside, they worked outside, they existed outside, that's how they grew. And we've lost that. We've lost that connection to our own evolution. For this change to have happened in two generations, human brains don't evolve that quickly. We can't make those adaptations. Children aren't making them. There was a school where they took away the asphalt and concrete, turned it into a natural area where kids could play in creeks, walk on logs, get dirty, and just have that kind of experience being outside. When they tested these kids, all of their academic scores went up and science increased dramatically. They just gave the kids a real space to learn to think. What we're really trying to do, I mean all of us, not simply Wilderness Youth Project or anyone, uh, is 
you know, make childhood relevant again. We're the last generation to have these memories. We're the last free range kids. It's time to pass these on to another generation and deal with the fears that are unreasonable and get parents thinking a different way. Childhood is important. It is an important time that we pass through as we move into mature adults and there are certain situations that just cause childhood to thrive and those are the things that we should be maximizing. <laughs> Unstructured time, natural settings, uneven terrain, something that moves the body in as million different ways as possible, unpredictability, <laughs> surprise, delight, that's childhood. The virtual world's place in this movement is, is definitely a complicated one. Okay, try again, C. It is C. Now we gotta find a bird. We have to find some acorns. And we know where to find the sky. Perhaps what's most important to remember about any of these experiences that kids have that blend the virtual world with the natural world is that there probably should be a firm foundation in the natural world first. That it allows the child to put the two in perspective. You start to hear the laboratory view of the situation. You know, uh, kids are too obese these days. The natural world, it solves ADD. And there's this whole list of, of problems, apparently, that, you know, the kids have. And you can find yourself in a position where what it sounds like we're saying is that kids are failing to be kids, which is categorically not true. Kids work as hard as they can every single day of their lives. That's what kids do. Kids aren't failing to do anything. And I think it will take 10 years for real, real changes that last. Changes in zoning, changes in laws, changes in education, changes in playgrounds. All of these things together we can do. We can make this happen if we all work on it and it's worth it for kids. And that is understanding the mindset of a military uh, structure. And the mindset that I have discovered through the military structure is um, creating fear. It's like a subliminal message that gets inside of us that has been ingrained in us since we were little. And that message is there so that whenever there's a certain situation, kind of like the training that happens with the dog, um, with that theory or that uh, a scientific experiment where they had the bell and they rang the bell. And every time they rang the bell, it was a way for the dog to come by and, and get the, uh, you know, get the, uh, the food or whatever, you know. Um, and, <clears throat> and I feel the same way about uh, when it comes to your mind and when it comes to certain triggers and reactions. There's a certain ways that we have been uh, taught to be and we have to confine to those ways that we are being in order to really function in this world. And I notice that that's what's causing most aging. That's what's causing disconnection. That's what's causing fear, doubt, um, scarcity, um, and conformity is the fact that we cannot form a new system when we are in fear. And then the forces that bring that fear actually have violence behind their fear so that 
if you actually try to transcend or ascend into a new system that you know that people can work with together that's going to be better. A system not of competition, a system of support, a system not of scarcity, but a system of abundance where you can create not only sustainability, but an opportunity out of every situation that really helps everybody grow together, not individually, but also collectively. So it's kind of like a unison con communication, and it's a cellular healthy uh, structure versus the military um, uh, mindset, which I noticed has um, artificial intelligence. So everything around has to be artificial for it to function, whether it's the food you eat, whether it's the way you learn, whether it's the way you communicate, um, whether the way you appear, it all has to be artificial. And that artificial ability, uh, that official conformity is how we function in the world. But does this conformity really give us an asset into our beingness and who we truly are? Um, and I can tell you from my experience that that is actually not the case. Because when you are conforming to artificial intelligence, you are disconnecting from your ability to receive love, communication, information that gives you real prosperity. Because prosperity is being able to access that which is prosperous and doing it right now in the present moment. But you lose that access if you are numbed from being able to access that information. And the way we become numb is we are given fear since we were children. So there are certain things that we hold the security. And if we have those securities, if you have like something like we all have vulnerabilities, right? Because we're all human beings. So we have the human side of us. And this whole military thing is about dehumanizing us. And so when you become scared, you become paralyzed from thinking properly and you don't necessarily maneuver your thoughts in a way that can help you function better, improve your life and change other people's lives. It becomes a place of hunger, it becomes a pay, place of sorrow, it becomes a place of shutting down and there's multiple ways that we shut down. We shut down by not listening to our feelings um, and doing things that don't make sense to us. We shut down by becoming super busy all the time we shut down by uh you know by by uh by by listening to loud music uh there's so many ways that we shut down and therefore we become in a we come in a very intense society where every little thing that really has to do with really bringing who we are becomes a target for the military because the military is a conformity system so if you have a new system that is better than the current system, that's going to help the current system shift so that we can all live a better life, um, that is not necessarily what this military construction wants. Because this military construction is like a, is like a forceful entity that comes from an abnormal cell growth. It's kind of like cancer that's maneuvering itself. But I think that um, that cancer and that force has has its disconnection and it's been articulated into the physical world in a very good way. I don't know fully what causes this, um, you know, this this trend, if you will. Uh, I don't know what causes this military trend, a hundred percent, in terms of a spiritual uh, situation. What really manifests all this chaos and all these military type behaviors um, I, I wish I knew because um, then I would try to um, to, to, to feel um, to to heal it to neutralize it to change to become a solution from what it is that um, that that is um, <clears throat> I don't know I think that religion tries to have an answer uh, to that. Um, but I think it kind of feeds on to that. Um, they try to say that maybe it's the demon, maybe it's Satan, maybe it's this, maybe it's that. But I don't know if they fully know either. I think that there are maybe other entities that may be causing some of these, like, hacking into the brains of the human mind um, that is causing some of these insane behaviors 
because these behaviors are absolutely insane. It is insane to be disconnected from the earth. It is insane to have um, enemies. Um, it is insane that we are fighting our own species, and it is insane that we even have a money system. Um, I think that all of that is absolutely insane. And, of course, there are people out there that want to change the paradigm. But the people that want to change the paradigm are having a difficult time to change the paradigm because they know that they have to also conform to the current paradigm. And if they don't conform to, conform to the current paradigm, while they get big and they have a lot of influence, they get shot, they get killed, they get murdered. And I can see that happening because I see it happening in the music, in music industry, in the movie industry. So if you become a person of large influence, and let's say you have money, and let's say in the beginning you did use the conformity, productivity, um, you know, action um, steps. And then all of a sudden you decided, you know, I'm not going to do that anymore. I don't, I don't want to feed into this whole you know, military way of being. And so I actually decided to change. And when you decide to change and you say to find out the world that, you know, all this money, all this shit, all this submissiveness, all this, you know, fear, you know, all these like uh, triggering type behaviors uh, is not going to be who you are anymore. And you're saying that in front of millions of people who have actually listen to every word you say and be, want it to become every word you say, there is a problem. There is a problem with the military structure. The military structure will then try to uh, say, uh, I'm going to, we're going to get rid of you because they're going to get rid of you because you are giving a different message that is actually um, an enemy to them. Because to them, anybody who is not conforming to the current system is an enemy. What does that look like? Well, a very simple example is that if you uh, have money, you have more power. And especially because money is a powerful tool in this militarized system, right? It's a, it's a tool that says yes or no. If I want to land with 100 acres... And I can't just go and declare that land. I have to go through the military system to get that land. So part of the military system is monopolies, monopoly, monopolizing the uh, the process. So I'm going to have to make money to do that. Um, hopefully, the good news is, is that we can take certain things that most that some people have invented that have had the courage, the charisma, the wisdom, the God-given talents and smarts. And then go ahead and promote those things to help us get better and make money in the process. That's my intention. That's my real passion. My real passion is to take that which allows us to move into a better paradigm um, and promote that and, and make money in that way. Because making money in a way that's actually maneuvering through the new paradigm is so much grat more gratifying than just making money um, it just doesn't make sense to me to just make money without doing something that's actually contributing to a better paradigm so with all of that said it is a little bit after 10 minutes i think youtube gives me about 15 minutes to talk but i think i've said a lot and um, i think that maybe it triggered maybe your train of thoughts as to what direction you want to go with your life and hopefully you want to go into the direction of a better paradigm and what that looks like to you. Um, you know, what is the world outside of this restrict? You know, if we have eliminated all the restrictions that we have and we replace them with something different, what would that look like to you? So that's my question for you today. Dr. Sufi back with another 1% tip for you. This week, I want to talk about AI. AI. AI is artificial intelligence. Now think about this. Our lives are completely owned and run by AI, artificial intelligence. Take a step back and think, how much time do you spend on your smartphone? How much time do you spend on your computer? Think about that. Time on social media, checking emails, surfing the net, Amazon, listening to music, 
All of that is artificial intelligence. And this is what I'm here to tell you. There's a really wise man, his name's Harari, he's written a number of books, and he talks about artificial intelligence and how amazing it is and how beautiful it is, yet the challenge is if we don't augment artificial intelligence with the other AI, which we call ancient intelligence, ancient intelligence is human consciousness, all of a sudden artificial intelligence is gonna run a bunch of really, really stupid and disconnected human beings. On the flip side, if we spent as much time on our human consciousness development, our ancient intelligence development, imagine that for a moment. Imagine if I asked you to spend a one-to-one -one ratio between artificial intelligence and human consciousness, ancient intelligence. Imagine how much connected, how much potent, how much powerful you'd be. Imagine the choices you would make when you negotiated with artificial intelligence. Imagine how we can make quantum leaps of how artificial intelligence could improve our lives, how artificial intelligence could help facilitate the healing process within people to allow them to connect and allow them to allow that life force to fully radiate through their entire being from the top of their head to the tips of their toes. So what I want you to focus on is human consciousness. First, take an inventory. Tomorrow, I want you to look at how much time you spend on AI. And there's a lot of great apps that you can plug into your phone. They'll let you know how much you're on your phone. Then, I want you to look at how much time you plug into artificial intelligence, meaning human consciousness. How much are you meditating, going within? One of the greatest things that I've done in my life over 25 years ago was make a commitment to a meditation practice. Just sitting, sitting with me, myself, and I. I came off that practice, I still did it every day, but sometimes it was waning as little as three to five minutes a day. Several months ago, I made a recommitment to my human consciousness practice, my ancient intelligence, if you will. So what I did was I made a commitment to meditate at least two hours every single day. Two hours of meditation, haven't missed a day. Some days is actually several hours. It's to the point, my friend, where I get up in the morning and I'm so excited to commune with that intelligence, that power, that grace of God that lives within all of us, to allow that and connect with that and allow that to be fully expressed into my world. The irony is I spend a lot less time on artificial intelligence and a lot more time thinking about how I can serve people, how I can make a difference in the world, how we can better facilitate this healing process. So I want you to focus on how you can make a 1% shift in your connection to your ancient intelligence, to your human consciousness, so you can show up being more potent, more powerful in every area of your life.
natural intelligence, the foundation to true common sense. So basically, brothers and sisters, in order to have common sense, to have proper reasoning, proper logic in your mind, so you can understand everything outside yourself, the first thing you must have, you have to have knowledge of self. It's, that's the genesis of all things. If you, ha if you don't have knowledge of self, you can never understand, you can never properly understand things outside yourself. That's some food for thought there, brothers and sisters. If you don't have your internal chaos in check, how can you expect to solve the chaos outside yourself? That's some food for thought for you. So in order to get yourself in tranquility, peace and harmony, you must re-establish your relationship with nature. It all begins with nature. Nature roots back to the Creator, the Most High, the one who created the heavens and the earth. When you get your relationship established back with nature, start having love and respect for the insects, the plant life, and the animals, your inner library starts to reawaken in your DNA. You start to reconnect with the records that are connected in the universe, in the omniverse. So when you get back to nature, that's the beginning of your roots to know, start the beginning to know where you came from, to know where you are, and to know where you're going. That's why it's a master key that you get back to nature and developing a relationship. Because nature reveals to you all things. Nature teaches us all things. Nature is the universal law of the way things are meant to operate. And if we fall out of line with, with the, how nature operates, we can't expect to be in tranquility, harmony, and peace in anything we do. If we're against nature, you can't expect to be living well. If you're, if you're against nature, you can't expect to elevate yourself. If you're against nature, you can't expect to think clearly. If you're in nature, if you're not in nature, you can't expect your body to be dis-ease free. You can't expect your body to be healthy. Therefore, you can never be wealthy since you lack health. It all begins from the inside, going to the outside of you. That's the fire of truth. So in order to gain common sense, brothers and sisters, get back to nature, develop that relationship, start eating the natural foods that you are meant to eat in nature, which is the vegetation of the land. You must eat living foods living electric foods to revitalize your physiology to its electric state so your brain can start sparking full of electricity in those neuron pathways those neural nexuses and connections will start to operate at its effective and efficient and quick and swift levels of operation you will begin to start understanding life. You will begin to start elevating yourself. You will begin to find happiness. You will begin to start knowing what which you were put on this, this earth to do. You will begin your true journey. Food for thought for you there. It all starts, it all starts in nature. 
It all starts by looking within and making positive changes in order to put yourself back in harmony with nature. Because most people out here today in modern society is at war with nature, do doing things unnaturally, artificially. That's why they're in war with nature. That's why they are, they have a deprivation of happiness in their life. They are so far away from nature that they don't know what to do anymore. They're not sure what goals to set anymore because their root and their foundation is not set upon the element of nature. So how can you go where you need to go, go where you want to go, do the things you want to do that make you happy if you don't have a foundation in doing things naturally as nature intended according to its universal laws that most people go against. The programs in us started to become fragmented, started to become deformed, started to go against nature, started to go, started to get turned inside out, reversed, twisted into spirals. That gives you a reason why things are the way they are today. So we as mankind must drop the foolishness, redevelop our reason, redevelop our logic. How do we get our reason, our logic, and true common sense back? We begin to get these things back by eating and living as close to as nature intended. Look at your faults, look at your weaknesses, and learn to strengthen those areas so they no longer become a weakness, or no longer become a hindrance, no, no longer become a bias, because those are the very things which is causing mankind to stay in its perpetual chaos. Get those things in check, and creation will start moving back in check. So what we have here is a diagram showing true intelligence and you'll notice that on the left brain we have intellect, the masculine components, and on the right brain we have intuition, the feminine component. Together with intellect and intuition we have what is called true intelligence. It is because we are optimizing our resources and we do not have imbalances toward one way of thinking or the other. So if we were to look at the meaning of the word artificial, by its etymological uh, definition, we see it is not natural. Uh, or it can be seen as art, right? As the word artificial has the word art, it says made by man, contrived by human skill, in labor. It also says imitation of or as a substitute for what is natural. And then another term is not genuine. So this is what artificial can be made of and then you question why some people might question the very nature of the word artificial intelligence when they first perceive it. Uh, it comes of no surprise to me being that it is something that is not natural or not genuine so people question it. If I were to talk to somebody and think that they were not genuine, I would question their motives and intentions. I would question who they are. You know, are they being themselves uh, or are they trying to be somebody else that they're not actually? Then if we are to look at the word intelligence, we see it means comprehending general truths, understanding, knowledge, power of discerning, and again, actually, the word art. So very interesting there. We have artificial intelligence, which can be seen as a form of art or creative expression, right, of human intelligence, then may you say. Um, and we're going to explain these as we move on here. I even have a diagram to show. But we have art, art twice here in a row. So artificial 
art. <laughs> and, uh, you know, this is also symbolic for the art that is all around us. If you look in nature, uh, there is art all around us. There's even quotes going back to saying that nature is the artist. And we are adding on to that or, you know, making representations of that natural art. So that's why painters like to stand at the edge of a horizon, maybe paint it for themselves so they can capture the moment. Hence, capture as in taking a picture, right? But then we see here it says knowledge, power of discerning. So the power of knowledge, which knowledge is power, is the power of discerning, and that is conscience. As you may have seen previously, conscience is the free will choice between right and wrong, knowing what right and wrong is and what to do and what not to do based off of that. It's also called apophysis. The process of apophatic inquiry is to decide the right actions based on knowing the wrong, or when you know the wrong actions, then you can know the right actions. It can work either way. That constitutes this knowledge, this intelligence. Okay, and we're just looking at the word intelligence, but if we are to add that then to artificial, it is having uh, this type of knowledge within a machine or having this type of knowledge inside a creation for which it will have knowledge itself, right? Does it have the power of discerning? Well, how is it programmed? And that's when people may go into depth and talk about, you know, machine learning, as they call it, learning, right? And so they are basically basing it all on the natural intelligence to create what they have as artificial intelligence. So they're creating a form of art based on a form of art. And you'll see another definition here for intelligence is between choice, between choose, interligere. Okay, so intelligence, interligere. So between our choices, what choices are right, what choices are wrong, what choices do we make in the world that we live in? Are they genuine or not? So now if we're going to look at the word art, it says result of learning. And again, we see the, the words knowledge and learning popping up here and here again and again. Um, and it also may represent weapons, which I figured to just highlight there due to Latin arma. Because, well, some view artificial intelligence as a weapon, or they may view knowledge as power as a weapon. If it is used to express uh, something bad or to express something that can create bad, right? Because, again, art is a reflection, a uh, expression of self. So based on what we learn, based on what we observe and we, what we come to understand through our intelligence, we create art. Now, is it based in something that's not natural or is it based in something that uh, is natural? That is going to then um, constitute if it's artificial intelligence or natural intelligence. And you'll see here, uh, liberal arts, it says this sense remains in Bachelor of Arts, meaning human worksmanship. Okay, so it means human worksmanship, the word art, as opposed to nature, it says. So as opposed to nature, it's human worksmanship. So instead of God's creation, it is human creation, right? Think uh, also the word artificial is often used in artificial food coloring or artificial flavors. And then there's natural flavoring, natural, um, you know, colors per se. And the natural isn't often talked about as much as the artificial because what is natural is all innate. It's already here. So it's not going to be talked about as much as that of which has been expressed that is new in the world of nature. So then we see it also says for art that it can be a system of rules and traditions for performing certain actions. Again, combining that with the word intelligence between choosing the power of discerning. Right. And then looking at the word art again, systems of rules and traditions for performing certain actions. Of course, our culture, our social status, everything is going to influence the actions that we make in this world that therefore they're going to influence our intelligence. So you may see the intelligence contributing to the art and the art contributing to the intelligence. So it's a between relationship within itself. 
and we are choosing our actions based on both factors, art and intelligence, and that within itself, you know, is intelligence. <laughs> so we can keep going down the rabbit hole and getting twisted in so many different ways. But let's keep looking at this for what it is and going back to the first point of true intelligence, if that is intuition and intellect, what does that really mean? And how can we relate that to art and artificial and natural intelligence? Well, intellect means reasoning truth. Reasoning truth. So reasoning nature, right? Because nature is all that is and has been. Something has a nature of its own. That's how it's, it's truthfully expressed, how it truthfully is in nature. So reasoning upon that is understanding, which we saw, you know, intelligence is understanding, comprehension, uh, comprehending general truths is said for intelligence. So intellect contributes to intelligence, but they're two different things. Okay, so intellect also says discernment, and it also means mind. Right? And we see the principle of mentalism and natural law, uh, which is that the all is mind. It's mental. right? And we use the word mental through many different means, including govern mental to control the mind. So you have to question here, what is being utilized, the left brain or the right brain? Well, we know that government is of more of a left brain type of thinking because it's more authoritarian. It's more of the telling what to do, not following what to do. So it's more of that leader, action-based, ambition-based mindset. So now, looking at then the other side of that, right, because we want to work with intellect and intuition for true intelligence, we see intuition means insight, direct or immediate cognition spiritual perception. Now, natural law is considered the spiritual laws, right? Because if they're God's laws, they apply it everywhere within this domain, this area we call the universe, the world, or whatever you want to call it. Insight, what does that mean? It means to look inside ourselves. So if intellect is to really look at truth and everything that's around us to discern right action, we also need that intuition to say, well, is it actually right for me to do this action? Um, can I learn from myself and not just the world around me? Can I learn from both? And that is intuition plus intellect. Because intuition is looking inward, right? It's looking toward that, that spiritual mentality. People meditate, they're looking inward. And so they believe we can look in to look out, right? To change ourselves, to change the world, a sort of reflective or transcendent process. And intellect may be equivalent to action in that regards, and intuition may be you know, equivalent to that sort of inaction, both to which can be essential at different times. Or you may see intellect as an expression of the intuition, right? So if there's knowledge that I have, intellect of the mind, I'm going to connect with my heart, with my right brain that has feelings, that cares to really I uh, see how to um, fit that into the world using um, consciousness, love, um, not just all analytics and not just um, telling people what to do, but actually caring to maybe help or guide someone. So there's different ways to perceive this relationship between intuition and intellect. As you see, intuition means to look at or to consider. Well, if we're always based in intellect, are we really looking into um, the feelings of somebody, not necessarily. Now, the word in, right, is at or on, and then turai, which means to look at or watch over. So to look in at something, to look in at oneself, to look in at that of which is spiritual perception, right? Because what does spiritual mean here when we say spiritual law is natural law? or spiritual perception is intuition. What does that mean? So if the intellect is much of man and mind, right? What about the spiritual perception? So we can't just have all ourselves or be all up in the clouds if we are to live in reality. We need a balance of both. Well, spiritual means of or pertaining to breath. 
something that makes humans different from machines is that we have breath. We can breathe, we have consciousness. Now you may say, okay, well machines, they need to have a proper way of ex exerting the energy as well. But again, how power efficient are they? Right, our breath is make what makes us unique um, as living beings or what some may want to call spiritual beings, right? Um, and that's why a lot of folks who um, look into this tend to get very spiritual when it comes to understanding nature as opposed to artificial because those who tend to look into the artificial don't look into the spiritual and then you end up having a war between science and religion or left brain versus right brain and we don't want that again we want to find a balance between intuition and intellect so let's understand spiritual is more of that right brain intuition pertaining to breath pertaining to consciousness something robots do not have so uh, if we want to understand that natural intelligence side of things, again, spiritual laws, natural laws of the universe, we want to look at um, what is pertaining to consciousness, breath, um, the intended uh, nature of human beings. We're not robots. We have life. Otherwise, we'd be dead. And robots are not living, so they don't have spirit which brings us to the next word right because spiritual is just a form of the word spirit and spirit means life i can't say a robot or something made out of artificial intelligence is a form of life and so it says spirit meaning supernatural immaterial supernatural so something that is very natural as opposed to artificial which is not natural and then immaterial, well, we see that artificial intelligence is always programmed into something that is of material, of a thing. In this consumerist and materialist world that we often have in the modern century, you have to question, are we left brain imbalanced, left brain dominant? Is the left brain ruling over the right brain because of its authoritarian nature? And so if spirit is supernatural immaterial, it says also a nature, essential. How essential is it to have a robot that replaces what we do if we can do it? Um, we have to question, you know, if a robot or aspects thereof artificial intelligence is not life, it does not have spirit. And therefore, if we embrace that, are we using our intuition? Are we living life? Or are we living a, a very artificial way of life? Because it's not of spirit, it's not of nature. And it's not of the essentials. What if we are to um, go about in our jobs, right? And find our workings, not have machines do it all for us. I mean, shouldn't we want to have some sort of direction for ourselves and enjoy what we do? Right. But then we say, oh, well, people have to do certain jobs. Do they have to for what? For more consumer goods. Things that also that you don't necessarily need as an essential part of nature. So question what is of spirit and what is of not? What is of nature and what is of not? What is of intuition and what is of not? And you can say for a fact artificial intelligence is not of spirit, is not of nature, and is not of intuition. However, it can be an expression thereof. How it impacts people is a different story. So we have the word learning because we touched on that previously and it says study, action of acquiring knowledge. Well, can we even acquire knowledge in the first place is the question I'm bringing to you because if we're looking at natural intelligence, it could just be considered intelligence. And can we even learn? If we are in a world where artificial intelligence is doing it for us or telling us everything that we need to learn and therefore we don't have much of a grasp on things ourselves or we are so dependent on this knowledge from certain sources that we are not learning for ourselves we're not learning the way nature intended so these again are questions to ask and i'm going to again present a diagram to really put this all into perspective but studying so are you really studying when you ask a machine, let's say Google, which is the common example in the modern century, uh, okay, well, what is the size of, you know, 
uh, a statue, a certain statue, or let's say, you know, what is the amount of calories in this and so forth. Instead of studying it for yourself and finding out for yourself, these machines will do it for you in an instant answer. You don't have to study at all. So are you really learning? Are you really acquiring knowledge or is it just being given to you? Instead of being guided to that knowledge through way of the universe and having that mystery and adventure of getting there, are there downfalls to actually just getting the answer straight up and having to know it all in a sense? And you say, oh, well, we can't know it all anyways. And we can move on then with knowing the things that we should know. Okay, but what about the basis of that knowledge? What if we get so attuned to such artificial intelligence and dependence on such knowledge that we don't know how to live without it? And that's why there's that theory of do we know what is real and what is not anymore? We become so illusioned by what is real because we thought that this way of living was so real after integrating ourselves with it and accepting it and embracing it as if it is natural when it's not. And so, again, these are thoughts to think about because they may take some time. And that's why there's many different videos within this video. And maybe that all adds to your perspective of these things. But we see learning also means knowledge acquired by systematic study. So learning from what the government is, is it actually a thing? Uh, how does it affect people? What is it made up of? Um, how does it run, you know, by the threat of violence, um, by man's law, and so forth? And then looking at the system of nature, right? The opposition of that artificial system that we created called government. And you'll see, okay, that's another system I can study. Uh, one that will give me knowledge. Anything I look at and I study in this universe, I can learn something from. But looking at a system is how everything connects and comes together, this integrative whole that I could then learn. And why would we want to do that, right? Why would we want to learn from the intelligence uh, within so we can become intelligent ourselves? It's so that way, let's say we are looking at that system. It is a whole, a whole system. And health means whole. So we are therefore learning how to heal to become healthy learning how to become more whole, to become whole, right? Or become content or fulfilled, right? Fulfilling to fulfill. These are just different ways of looking at the same concept. Now, looking at the word no, because again, we have to look at all these different aspects here. If we're looking at knowledge, which is intelligence and so forth, again, we see being able to distinguish free will. Do we have free will when artificial intelligence is making decisions for us and saying, well, this is the best decision for you, but yet it's programmed by certain beings who aren't in your environment. And you say, oh, well, the machines will then, you know, go upon your environment or you will program the, the machines and they will become smarter and so forth, all the different excuses that are made. But it's all about, do you have a sense of direction yourself? Do you need to be dependent on some sort of source to to give you this knowledge and to tell you what to do in your own life when you were basically born with that ability and all you got to do is use it that's natural intelligence so why why then what, what, what that's the question you might be asking you may be asking well why um you know why why go about doing all this then why go about making artificial intelligence if if we already have this ability to distinguish and they say oh to make your life easier to make your life easier but understanding fact or truth when the truth is that we weren't born with robots the truth is that artificial intelligence wasn't born into this creation what if we have everything that we've always needed as human beings because we were born into this universe think food right Think, think our chemistry, our bodily blueprint of how things are supposed to work. What happens when we work with what is intended and what is all around us? The blueprint to life, if you will. Well, we work in harmony. We're guiding. We're defending. We're nourishing. That stands for nutrient. We're not introducing anything new. We're simply working with what is. And you say, okay, well, artificial intelligence is supposed to help us do that. Okay, it can, because again, it's the expression 
of humankind. So it's not entirely a bad thing. But then again, with the intellect, which is that robotic, more analytical side of things, giving us all the details, we need to also have that intuition still intact so we can make our own decisions. The intuition is of the natural law and the intellect is of the free will. But the intuition tells us what is right and wrong. It tells us the universal natural intelligence. Whereas the left brain is more of that human intelligence that we base off of that and of how do we bring artificial intelligence about into the world thereafter. Okay, But without understanding natural intelligence, that's when we start losing touch with ourselves and when we introduce artificial intelligence only with that and with no mention of natural intelligence or no encouragement of natural intelligence and it's not guiding natural intelligence, we're forgetting the root that actually built artificial intelligence. So it's like building a computer and if one doesn't know the basics to building a computer, well, even though they know all the rest, they can't do it. And they end up having to go back to square one because they didn't uh, know knowledge, the basic premises to that creation. And so it becomes their own downfall because now they have to go back and look at all the basics of it. They're pretty much obligated to if they want to move forward. So going back to move forward sounds ironic, but we have this polarity within nature as we do know as well. So to know says to perceive or understand as a fact or truth. We talk about that perception must align with the frequency of truth, or simply put, let's say it's a wavelength, right? We have this frequency line. We want to align ourselves with that of which is the line of truth. And the more we intercept with that line, the closer we are to becoming even with that line. And this is like any rate wavelength where, you know, the the higher this frequency, um, the more often we're intercepting it, the more often we are closer to the truth. But we can't be fully aligned with the truth. It's just, it's impossible. Now, machines can try to create this perfect world per se, as some want to say, and they can be programmed to do certain things like that. Okay, right? But do we know for ourselves what is fact, you know, and what is not a fact, what is truth and what is incorrect. Is there any importance to having that self-free will that is part of human nature, or are we just going to give that to machines? We must keep in mind ourselves. We must always, and that's why we see the word recognize here for knowledge. We must recognize what is here, recognize our role on earth, and not just go about in thinking we can do whatever we want, uh, to the earth and that it is completely our domain, left brain and balance. We can just create anything and forget the spirit, forget nature, forget uh, the consciousness of beings who feel um, harm from that or feel like they're not learning or they feel like they have a lost sense of mystery. Or um, it, Those feelings are important and we should not suppress that and say overwriting that with analytics into saying, well, we, we can make them a better person if we change this about them. Then we have a sense of control on our hands, right? And we see the word recognize means resume possession of land. To resume possession of land. What land does man actually own? They don't. They act as if they do. But it's actually God's land. It's nature's land. The land is just the land. Right? And so we can say, okay, we own this land, but we don't actually. And the difference, though, between this type of logic, you know, and uh, artificial uh, logic is that we're creating something new. Uh, so if I were to create a different type of land based on a natural form of land and say this is the possession. But the point is here is to recognize, right? It means to know again. To know again. What does that mean, to know again? It means to look back at our roots, to know where we are, where we belong, 
Do we belong in an artificial, man-made, machine world? I think most people can agree we don't. Even if they do work in artificial intelligence, even if they work on it all the time, you know, even if they support it, it doesn't matter. We need to recognize what is here all around us. Otherwise, we're going to feel the harm backfiring on us. We're going to recognize, well, <laughs> we probably shouldn't have tried to be God because there's only one true God. And it's not humans. Humans can never try to be, even if they do. Even if they try to figure out every aspect, they're never going to outsmart nature because nature has this intelligence to which, without natural intelligence, we wouldn't even be able to make what we made. So we think we can test the time, test the boundaries of nature. But that's when we start leaving our own boundaries and start getting hurt, may you think it as such. So we see recognize, re, again, and cognoscere, which is to get to know. So again, knowing. Knowing again, knowing who we are, knowing our belonging. And we see there recognize, well, I brought up the word cognition, which is the ability to comprehend the mental act or process of knowing. Again, do we have the ability to think, the ability to know? Are we seeking universal knowledge of nature, not just the knowledge that is given to us by machineries? about the material world around us that is also built by man, therefore keeping us out away from nature by all means. And we probably don't want that if we want to recognize, to know, to learn, and to therefore have a balance between the intuition and the intellect. So the word knowledge means acknowledgement, acknowledgement, okay, of a superior honor or worship so people want to also bring intellect into the realm of science and think there's no form of worship being done, but we see that people look up to machines as if they're going to help the whole universe and that they're going to guide human beings into different ways of thinking, and it's going to do it for them in many regards. Well, you know, then you're worshiping something that's artificial, something that isn't natural. Right? But it's it's worship, nonetheless, and it is looking upon that that higher entity of of uh, than self, and so it's acknowledging. What are you acknowledging? Are you acknowledging nature? Or are you acknowledging a man-made machine? And by artificial intelligence logic, if it's to work for us, we're constantly looking up to that machine. And you may say, oh, well, that machine will then help us acknowledge that entity, but we can just interact with that entity ourselves. We don't need to go through artificial intelligence to do it. It can help us in our process, but do we need to be dependent on it? That's the question. Is it going to interfere with our connection to that higher nature, to God, or is it going to bridge our connection to that higher nature, God? So I also picked out the word ledge out of knowledge, so ledge means to lay down, to lie down. And this is just important to know because if you're looking at the word knowledge, you're laying down the knowledge, laying down what needs to be known. What needs to be known? That we're human, that we're conscious, that we have the ability to love, that nobody should rule over another human being, that we should do right behavior. It is wrong to commit acts of violence. These things, are they taught by the modern system that be? Are they going to be taught by machines which don't feel? So therefore, they might not very much talk about harm, especially since they're developed by potential companies or corporations, which we know governments are, says so in, in the code of different government uh, scriptures. So I say the scripture there too, because we're putting our belief system in a government not necessarily a quote-unquote God as we call it in religion, but we're putting it now in a government because we believe they can create the change that we want to see in the world for us, and we give them that, that permission through way of our beliefs. Our beliefs set the stage, and they can therefore restrict us or bring us together. Uh, and so restrict us from that connection to nature or bring us closer to our connection to nature. 
And that is where religion comes into place as religare, which means to restrict or to bind, or religio, meaning to connect. There's different versions of such term religion. So tap into your natural intelligence is the core message of this, uh, because it's not often talked about for the very reason that it's natural and we live in a very materialistic consumer based world. And again, I'm not saying that's the entirely bad thing here, but looking upon the definitions of the words, why would we want to detach ourselves from a state of being that we are learning from anyways for artificial intelligence? Why do we seek dominion over nature to replace uh, what um, is here naturally? And then if we say it can help what is here naturally, how is it helping? Is then the question. You know, does it suppress a human nature? Is it still, what, what's the purpose of it to do? It's to make our life easier. Well, again, how is it making our life easier? Is that meant to be a learning process instead? Is that meant to be a journey, a mystery? Do, does our imagination go out the window with that then? Is our life more confined and constricted and more conformed to everybody else's because we're all following that same knowledge Whereas in nature, it, it's very environmental. It feels out everything. And you say, well, robots can be programmed for all of this. And artificial intelligence will keep in mind all these aspects. So you want it to completely replace life then. Because life is that vast imagination, that vast mind, that vast exploration, which you're not going to get anywhere else. So you'd be replacing nature itself if you're going to replace natural intelligence and natural intelligence will still outsmart that because the only way artificial intelligence can grow again is by going back to the basics, going back to nature. Learning from nature to dominate nature, just as learning how human beings are dependent on certain sources or uh, get stuck in certain ways of thinking so that way there can be further uh, restrictive measures done on those human beings that push them to those ways of thinking, makes them easier to control because they're keeping knowledge away, and so forth. So we have a quote here from Albert Einstein. He says, the harmony of natural law reveals an intelligence of such superiority that compared with it, all the systematic thinking and acting of human beings is an utterly insignificant reflection. Again, showing the power of what is natural intelligence. It is truly powerful. Again, spirit, supernatural, immaterial, essential. Again, I can't say these things for artificial intelligence. It's simply just an expression of what is natural. And therefore, it could be good or it could be bad dependent on the knowledge. So we're going to get to that because the source right, of our knowledge is very important. Where we get our knowledge from is then going to turn into our actions. And our actions are our wisdom. And that then, all our actions together manifest into the outcome, the reality, the world that we live in. We essentially help make up the world. However, the world has specific laws which dictate how things will manifest, and that is natural law. It's the consequences to our behavior. So I commit a certain action. The laws dictate where those actions go, especially if those actions are uh, right or wrong, and that then for, therefore goes to the idea of karma. Or, or the golden rule, or the law of attraction, all go into the same idea of natural law. Now we have another quote here, nature, the unseen intelligence, which loved us into being and is disposing of us by the same token. Again, representing this polarity, this irony to it, which is why natural intelligence can be misunderstood by many folks. And this is a quote by Albert Hubbard. So Albert Hubbard, I'm sorry, and the unseen intelligence, the occult knowledge, which the natural law is also considered, right? I can't say that these are are visible. They can be observed and understood, but they're not visible, just as uh, the laws of density are, for example, or perspective. I can't see that, but uh, I can see it in its motion through my understanding of the knowledge of how nature works. So certain things like chakras as well, just because it's unseen does not mean it isn't working. And so just think about that for a second and you'll see intelligence really goes down to, uh, well, our understanding of the world around us. 
and artificial intelligence will never be a match for natural stupidity is a common quote that people use, and this is a quote by Joseph Addison. Of course, natural stupidity is something that happens for great reason, right? If people are doing something bad, again, taking the word stupidity as something that represents um, bad things happening, people doing things unconsciously, if you will, um, it it will mean that people aren't really thinking about what they're doing. They're not really using their intellect, and nor are they using their intuition, because if they use their intuition, they wouldn't want to create harm or do something bad uh, based on also the knowledge that they have that it is bad. Um, so, you know, that intuition is that natural law aspect of why is it bad, why they shouldn't do it, and that uh, intellect part is that free will saying, well, yes, uh, I have to make the decision that it is bad and therefore I should not do it. Artificial intelligence will never be a match for that natural stupidity because people will always um, do good, people will always do bad, and again, natural intelligence is above artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence depends on it for its own existence. Then we see here, quote, if we surrendered to Earth's intelligence, we could rise up rooted like trees, a quote by Rainer Maria Rilke. Uh, Rilke sorry. And um, it says, so Earth's intelligence, that can be seen as natural intelligence, and we could rise up rooted like trees because we have a grounding in what is here and what is intended. We don't have a grounding in something that is artificial, something that's wrapped in the opinion of man that's dogmatic, that's not universal, that's not timeless, just like man's law. Uh, instead, we are rooted to something that is natural, like natural law, which is something everybody can understand, given the understanding, given learning, and that in natural intelligence to then become rooted and grounded. But we can't become as rooted and grounded in artificial intelligence because by its very nature, it's not rooted. It's not natural. So this is just quite an irony to explain, is it not? We have here, quote, every heart has a divine intelligence and natural guidance system. So again, referring to natural intelligence. With every prayer, every meditation, and every thought of love, we tune into ours. A quote by Marianne Williamson. So by taking the time to seek that intuition, we are seeking what is natural law, the intelligence of nature, so we ourselves can reflect and become naturally intelligent, their human intelligence. So then we have here, quote, it is the natural and inherent impulse of life to seek to live more. It is the nature of intelligence to enlarge itself and of consciousness to seek to extend its boundaries and find fuller expression. This might be very well the uh, explanation for why we create artificial intelligence or art within itself. And this is a quote by Wallace D. Waddles. And this just shows you that artificial intelligence can be used for good, but it also can be used for bad. And we need to understand that it could be either one for sure. It's not just one way or the highway, and it's not something we should just pass off and say, oh, we're creating it, oh, it's going to be hap it's going to happen anyways, and blah, blah, blah. If we have knowledge of the natural intelligence and the natural laws, then it doesn't matter what comes into existence because we know who we are, and we know about what is right to do and what is wrong to do, and therefore, nothing could really take us down because we have the knowledge that transcends and is above artificial intelligence. It's more important. And so then we have here, quote, intelligence without ambition is a bird without wings. And this, again, refers to intelligence coming from intuition, again, natural intelligence, um, and then ambition, which is action. So again, intellect of the left brain. Uh, and so that represents left brain working with right brain to then make the bird, the bird that flies, because now we have two parts working together. And this is a quote by Salvador uh, Dali. Then we have here, quote, what is art? It's not just nature, it is nurtured nature. It is intelligence applied to what physical ability you have. A quote by Rudolf Nureyev. Okay, so... Nureyev, and this is a quote talking about art, again, which the word art is an artificial, and so 
artificial intelligence comes thereof natural intelligence, comes of human intelligence, and we could use it for good, we could use it for bad. It is always of nature. Does it mean that it's going to work for nature? It's a different story. And so we have the question, well, how, why would we create it? Well, we create it because we have inner desires of our own, inner desires. Are those desires out of need? Again, going back to the idea of contentedness, um, fulfillment in our life. Do we actually need these things that we create or can we learn to live content with what is here, what is of nature? So nurtured nature and nature can make up what is art um, and see it as behind that is a desire to create based on creation. Think of ourselves as creators based on the creation or the creator um, and it's all a reflection process. So what we create is a reflection of our desires as a reflection of who we are and what we are to do and so forth. It is nothing to ever see as bad, but it can turn into something that is harmful for the current world. Shall we not understand its fuller context of nature, um, what it's actually doing to the world if art seeks to replace the art of nature, which it shouldn't because it needs its own reliance on such. So you ask, well, why would then, why would, you know, an artificial creation uh, ever go against its creator, which is not just us, but nature itself? And truth is it can't because it exists within the world. It's always going to exist within the laws of nature, but the laws of nature isn't all good. It's, it counts for good and bad. So bad things can happen as by natural law. Natural law dictates what, what's going to happen, good or bad. That's what we call positive or negative expression. Okay, so if it's based in love, it's going to result in positive expression. If it's based in fear, it's going to result in negative expression. Well, let's think machines. Okay, if people are in fear, so they think machines should keep them secure at all times and therefore should watch over them and make sure that their whole life is guarded by machines so they can constantly, you know, for your privacy and your security, as the government has often said that, to unleash their troops, and which is why they're working on artificial troops. You have to question, well, why? Why do I need this? You know, is this a lack of protection within my natural self? That I feel like I need this external dependence uh, to keep my natural self aligned? Is this actually safe? You know, now we have more authoritarian control because of that. Just look at George Orwell's 1984. It describes this quite well. And so there's question as to, you know, why? Why would we even do this in the first place? But you can't stop it. You can't. Artificial intelligence is an expression of self, as I said, art is. But do we need to spend as much money that we do on there? Do we need to encourage it and emphasize it as much as we do? Um, do we need to keep working on that while completely disregarding and forgetting natural intelligence? Well, it sounds bizarre to me. As you he see here, there's a quote that says, Knowledge without spirit is like finding yourself on a cold night with all the wood in the world and no flame to ignite it. So, again, this is having that intellect without intuition. And there's no flame, there's no breath, there's no light, shall you say, in that creation. Uh, and so this is a quote by Guy Finley. And so it's representing that, again, that necessity of the right brain working with the left brain and the left brain working with the right brain. It's really a necessity because the imbalances in nature always uh, seek to be fixed. Right. That is what learning is. It's learning uh, what what is intended, what is um, meant to be. And the balance is meant to be. The world works so everything can be in a balance. And so knowledge and spirit are supposed to work together. Ambition and intuition are supposed to work together. Intellect and intuition are supposed to work together. Action and inaction are supposed to work together. See it as you wish. The Tao also represents this irony quite well. The Tao Te Ching, it's a book um, that has been used throughout ancient China. Now you'll see here, this is a diagram showing human intelligence versus artificial intelligence. Looking at the cons of both. So human intelligence, again, 
can be seen as natural intelligence, but it's not nature's intelligence. It's uh, human intelligence. So you may say it's human natural intelligence or natural human intelligence. It's important to distinguish what is natural intelligence um, compared to human intelligence because uh, nature has its own intelligence and humans are a part of nature, but uh, they have their own intelligence uh, based on that and based on what they create, which is artificial intelligence. So think of human intelligence as based on natural intelligence and artificial intelligence based on human intelligence. Again, I will have a diagram after this to show what I mean. And it says humans are fallible. They have limited knowledge bases. Information processing of serial nature proceed very slowly in the brain as compared to computers, and humans are unable to retain large amounts of data and memory. Now, I will say one thing for sure, though, is that those things don't necessarily mean that they're bad. Okay, humans are fallible. Well, what if we are all perfect? Where's the fun in that? Where's the imagination? Where's the journey? Where's the creativity? There'd be no point. There'd be no point to that imagination. And we live in this, you know, so-called perfect world, uh, which doesn't exist. It, it doesn't resist in reality. Therefore, it's just a fantasy mind. That's why we've written books and movies on it. And perhaps it's convinced some people or inspired some people to try to create that reality. But again, we don't want to go beyond the laws of nature. We want to know the laws of nature. That way we don't violate them and cause harm because we are go going beyond our boundaries uh, as humans within nature. So human intelligence, learning from natural intelligence, learning from artificial intelligence. So they know the right actions to take within their own life. Then it says information processing of serial nature proceed very slowly in the brain that is true right the processing speed um, isn't always as fast but again that has benefits of its own we're all here for one another we all um, have different passions of our own and understand certain knowledge more than others there'd be no point to learning no point to teaching uh, without that and humans are unable to retain large amounts of data uh, in memory same thing uh, it's very important that we're not overloaded with information either. Why would we want to retain large amounts of data and memory uh, unless we want to be robots ourselves, which many people also fantasize over? It then just goes back to the artificial intelligence, which you'll see the con says no common sense. How can that ever be a good thing? See, the difference between the human intelligence and the artificial intelligence cons is that the stuff under human intelligence, I don't see as cons to the great degree they're just hindrances or disturbances to some people who just don't want to learn now we see artificial intelligence says it cannot readily deal with mixed knowledge so that's great we ha have a lack of intuition a lack of um, integrative knowledge about about nature and the world around us because it's so dependent on who's programming it a human uh, intelligence. So isn't that interesting that artificial intelligence is based on human intelligence, but artificial intelligence seeks to improve human intelligence by studying all the humans that are within natural intelligence, thinking that that will be the solution. That is what's going to make it perfect. Yeah. Well, is those really realistic expectations to have? Are these even good expectations when people are still failing to make a living and do simple things in life? Why are we complicating things so much to the degree that, you know, there's still suffering, there's still basic problems on Earth that aren't being solved? And why are the powers that be so invested in artificial intelligence? Does it have something to do with control and who has the power, who has the knowledge? That's the big question at hand here. Again, are we left brain imbalanced? Are we not seeking that intuition, that natural intelligence? And are we just seeking how to control the world more and more so that way uh, it is more easy for ourselves, uh, talking about the power system that be, this is their way of thinking, uh, that way they feel like they have more sense of security over their own lives uh, by ruling others because that sense of insecurity they feel is um, created into confidence when they start ruling over other people and feel like they have this ego or power sense that gives them uh, this power high uh, that they enjoy over time and you know not to mention you could feel numbed out by this i say power is a denaturing aspect within itself only because um, power is something that will that can be turned into uh, 
can be turned against people who don't have that knowledge. And that's what they do. It's called occult knowledge, and it's keeping certain knowledge away from the masses, so that way they're kept in the dark while um, the ones that do have the knowledge are kept in the light. So they have the knowledge that can rule over others, and because those are in the dark do not understand, they are unable to uh, unenslave themselves unless they have that knowledge and can seek and acquire it. it. Hence the importance of natural intelligence, but why it's not taught or why it's not encouraged. Now, that would then include natural law, of course. Now, artificial intelligence, it says, may have high development costs. Yeah, well, you know, look who's printing the money. Look who's in charge of the money supply. Um, look who's constantly asking for the money. And you'll see it's often for machinery or man-made goods, which money within itself is man-made. So it all makes sense there. And again, I don't see anything good with that. It's just more theft as taxation, more uh, theft from um, people who never voluntarily gave that money. Or um, let's say they did, they were convinced that, you know, this is something that they need, even though they, of course, could invest it into natural intelligence, uh, which artificial intelligence is to bring us to anyways. So then it also raises legal and ethical concerns, very much so, but not legal with man's law, legal with n natural law, because it's, again, potentially compromising natural intelligence or um, because artificial intelligence is never as holistic as natural intelligence, it's messing with uh, a greater force uh, that it seeks um, to replace, in a sense, um, by its creator's intention, or um, it is not keeping it at, at mind because it doesn't have a mind of its own. It's only being programmed a certain way, and therefore it's, it, it can lack some very essential aspects that can create concerns in the smallest of places which do add up uh, at the end of the day. Ethical Yes, is it right or is it wrong? Machines don't think about that at all, and that's why they don't have common sense or conscience to decide right and wrong action. So they have no free will and no intuition. It's just pure data. That's all it is, and it's based on left brain imbalance in humans. Uh, so that is artificial intelligence to the bad sense. Artificial intelligence to the good sense is still having all those cons, but uh, helps us achieve common sense helps us achieve mixed knowledge, uh, helps us save money, uh, helps us uh, understand ethics and understand what is natural law. So um, it's, it's getting rid of the cons that are in artificial intelligence, but by way of human intelligence, simply expressing oneself. So I wouldn't even consider artificial intelligence. It's simply human expression. So it's human intelligence right to natural intelligence right back to human intelligence. Artificial intelligence is not a thing, right? In that regards, um, it is just seen as the expression of humans. So then we see here another graph, natural versus artificial intelligence. Uh, the preservation of knowledge in natural intelligence is perishable. Artificial intelligence is permanent. Uh, and again, we can look through all these different aspects and we'll see the same uh, comparisons that I made previously.
Now, very ironic it is that we also have many folks who work on artificial intelligence who say how dangerous it is, yet they continue to work on it. For example, here we have a quote here, I think the danger of AI is much greater than the danger of nuclear warheads by a lot, and nobody would suggest we allow the world to just build nuclear warheads if they want. That would be insane, and mark my words, AI is far more dangerous than nukes. And that is a quote by Elon Musk. You know, people often put their belief into, again, artificial intelligence, and they look up to it um, without looking at that bigger picture. So uh, people are suggesting to just build it uh, if people want it. And just out of just pure desire, if they think, oh, this is going to help my life, I want it, without really thinking about the natural law, without thinking about the implications. And that is a great part of what makes it dangerous, is we are willing to just drop our consciousness, drop our humanity, drop our natural intelligence to just surrender and accept something that we believe will help our life so much more because it is replacing our consciousness and um, doing things for us, which we can otherwise do. We simply are ignorant to do it. We are ignorant of the knowledge that we actually should do it by nature. And uh, that if we are to use artificial intelligence, it's to simply help us do that of which is of nature, that of which is of natural intelligence. Even Elon Musk says, another quote, with artificial intelligence, we are summoning the demon. And that is a very powerful statement to make. You have to question why. Well, again, going back to the archontic explanation, archon means master or ruler. It also means a demonic entity, which is seeking material possession over everything in the spiritual life, and therefore crushing the spiritual with the physical, the material realm. And it, the archon is this, this material-based uh, god, worshipped god, um, that people will feed off of. This is Gnostic knowledge. Um, and it goes very similar to the idea of artificial intelligence, as some people refer to it as archontic intelligence for that reason. So not actually a surprising quote when you look into it, because um, some people will understand that by looking at the archons and then looking at the opposite of archon is anarchy, which is accepting, again, the chaos, which is the teacher, and anarchy means no rulers, which nobody has the right to rule over you. So anarchy is already here. It's all around us. It's freedom. Freedom's all around us. And so we have the question, are we just suppressing what is nature, what is natural? And we lack the knowledge of what anarchy is. We lack the knowledge of what nature is. And therefore, we seek dominion over all that is of nature and all that is natural. And that's why we have occult knowledge kept away from us so we stay dumbed down and ignorant. And we, you know, shun people who, who think differently in the world. Well, you have to ask these questions because artificial intelligence, if programmed a certain way, often is getting people to think the same way. And it is always material. Artificial intelligence is never natural. By its very meaning of its words, it's not natural. It says here, quote, artificial intelligence is the science of making machines do the things that would require intelligence if done by men. So we require intelligence to do things in this life, and we want to skip this process and say, let AI do it for us. Let AI run our lives. Well, AI is developed by what, some companies, some few people, some corporations, governments or corporations. Well, look what's in charge of us again in our life. Government, systems, powers that be, archons, okay? So this is a quote by Marvin Minsky. Then we have a very common quote that is used and it says, artificial intelligence is a tool, not a threat. A quote by Rodney Brooks and <laughs> We hear this one a lot when we do research on artificial intelligence, and you have to question, there's so much people defending artificial intelligence because they know people freak out when they hear the word. They know people freak out when they think about the movies that the display it in certain ways. But you know, this is why the movies maybe perhaps do so well, right? Perhaps because it also helps us feel that, that intuitive right brain aspect 
that society uh, has always really thrived on. And artificial intelligence is only intellect. How is it not a threat if it's left brain imbalance? How is it not a threat if it's potentially replacing jobs? How is it not a threat if it's not natural, not of spirit, not of intuition? So we're not listening to ourselves. We're suppressing ourselves. We're putting our dependence in something. We're having material goods over our life. How is that not a threat? It very well can be. Just as much as it can be a tool, it can be a threat. Because again, knowledge as power can be used for good or bad. We are taking intelligence, which is knowledge, and doing good or bad with it. Art, an expression of the human self, can be good or bad uh, in its effect, of course. right? So artificial intelligence, the expression of knowledge. Are you going to do good or bad with that knowledge? Well, it depends. So you can't just say it's straight up not a threat. That's just the reassurance of saying, oh, it's not a threat. You don't have to worry about it. Just Let's just keep working on it. Let's just keep finding it. You know, it's going to make our life so much better. Completely disregarding natural intelligence. What is natural intelligence? So apparently natural intelligence is the threat. Okay, so both are not the threat. Both are supposed to work together. Okay. Well, can they ever be a threat? Yes, they can. Anything can be used for bad. Anything. If you know how to use it, that's intelligence. So it's very ironic that one will not use intelligence to even make a statement, uh, to understand the statement that they're making here. Because artificial intelligence not being a threat can very well be a threat. Because a tool can very well be used as good or bad within itself. So it can be a tool, and it can be a threat, and it can be a tool that can be a threat. It can be intelligence that isn't based on nature and therefore a threat within itself without anyone telling you if it's a threat or not. Why do we take people's word on this? Why don't we look into it for ourselves? And we see here on the Wikipedia, it says artificial intelligence, AI, is intelligence demonstrated by machines. Unlike the natural intelligence displayed by humans and animals, which involves consciousness and emotionality. Again, going back to the idea that machines don't have intuition, they do not have that right brain aspect. They do not have those hearts, um, those chakra systems, those feelings, that spirit, that breath, that life-giving force. So they're not natural. Because it says unlike the natural intelligence. Well, artificial is not natural. So it's not of nature. But that's okay, right? Because it's still within nature. No, not necessarily. Because again, natural law considers both the good and the bad. And natural intelligence includes understanding natural law. It's understanding the intelligence within nature. To which understanding natural law will tell humans, yeah, this world is designed quite with us at mind and quite with um, everything, doing everything, everything being connected, everything having a cause and effect which is what natural law is also considered. Again, going back to the idea of law of attraction, golden rule, karmic law, moral law, God's law, so forth. And you'll see so many articles time and time again, why we shouldn't fear artificial intelligence, why I don't fear artificial intelligence. These are modern posts. The Terminator shows us why we don't need to fear an AI. And you'll see, um, you know, somebody asked a question here on Quota, this is a website where people ask questions, and it says, why do we need AI at all? Why is its inception necessary? So I highlighted the word need here, because that is a very important term here. And the person who answered this said, yes and no. Yes and no. So there's a no to this, but there's also a yes. And that is what we must understand to this. Because again, if it's an expression of humankind, that expression can manifest in good and bad ways, to which our natural intelligence always must understand. Always. So it always starts with natural intelligence, and it always ends with natural intelligence. Artificial intelligence is always somewhere in between. It is never the end, or never the beginning. So why aren't we focusing on that all-surrounding 
intelligence that is of nature. And more upon this, let me just remind you, simplicity, less stuff, less work, less expense equals more money, more time, more joy. By adding new things to our life, if we think it makes our life easier, it very well, ironically, may not. Because living with what is here, what is all around us, what nature has given us, is all we need to do, especially if it's just understanding that to become our best selves. So why do we want more and more and more and more and get more confused about who we are in this world and what this life is to do and so forth? If that's just going to keep us scrambled, confused, and not knowing what we're doing in this life and therefore more dependent on power systems that be, whether that's robotics or people who claim to rule over our lives. So less equals more. Less equals more. And you see here, less is more is also a common quote. Less shopping, more outdoors, less clutter, more space, less rush, more slowness. And, and the reason why I mention this is because we live again in this world that constantly asks for more. So you will see the trend, not just in consumerism with everyday goods and groceries and so forth, but with technology and intelligence. So we seek more knowledge, more intelligence. But does that actually mean the intelligence from nature? which is rather simple at the end of the day, right? Especially if it's of common sense. So we're lost in the details talking about all these philosophical things, but we can forget something so simple, such as the power of love, the power uh, of morality, what is a right and wrong action, because we look so deep into the details and that's why we get so lost or we get too analytical and left brain imbalanced. And if we don't think at all about these things, then we're right brain imbalanced because we're just accepting everything. Um, just as it is with no question, you know, as to uh, if, if it's, you know, actually right or wrong still. So again, the, both sides of the brain must be at work here. All sides must be at work here. And so artificial intelligence has its place. Natural intelligence, of course, has its place. And so less consuming, more creating, less junk, more real food, less busy work, more impact, less driving, more walking, Less noise, more solitude, less focus on the future, more on the present. Less work, more play, less worry, more smiles. And, you know, you have to question, well, artificial intelligence is going to make us, you know, lay back and have more fun in our life. Will it really? Will it really? Is the question that you have to ask. Because so many people, I'm afraid, do not question that themselves and they don't base it on natural intelligence, to which they should, if they want to have a greater sense of intelligence within itself. Now, here's another quote. More freedom means more jobs, less government, and less taxes. More freedom means more jobs. Well, isn't that funny? We talk about artificial intelligence replacing our jobs and then us becoming dependent on machines to not only produce those things for us, but us as consumers, we're constantly consuming, dependent on our consumption within itself and what we are consuming. And we have less freedom in our lives because of that. We feel less free, we're less simple because of that. A simple life is saying, well, I don't need that. I'm fine just the way I am. I'm fine with what I have. This is simple, this is all I need. And so even if robots provide us with everything in the world, this sounds simple, but then you're still getting so much of them and they still require energy output. And you say, oh, well, everything will just run by itself. Everything will just run by itself. Where's the freedom in something that's so confined to such one way of doing things? Right? And you say, well, humans are always going to do things. And, you know, that's the freedom of having it is that some machines will do this. They'll do the most important things. And what's the most important things? Why can't humans do it? You know, what is so drastic that we need machines to do? And this, of course, that within itself is a narrative created by the power systems that be. And so this is a quote by Todd Akin. Now, we have another quote. Government will use whatever technology is available to them to combat their primary enemy, their own population. So they will use whatever technology is available and it would make sense that if they invest more time, more money into artificial intelligence, it's becoming more available to them. Therefore, they can do their objective better, which is 
ruling over the population. Now you may ask, well, why would they want to do this? Well, again, it's simple. What if it's demonic entities, certain energies, certain egos, certain um, denatured feelings, like I'm obligated to be in this position, I'm obligated to obey, I'm obligated to do this, you know, people depend on me, they see me as this hero, I can't uproot my life, I can't uproot my family, not looking at the ethics, not looking at the laws, and just going about a system that can very well be artificial within itself, unnatural within itself, and therefore feeding off of everything that is unnatural, everything that is artificial, including artificial intelligence, and the people within won't question it because they don't use their natural intelligence. But if they used their natural intelligence, they would not let artificial intelligence rule over them. They would not let artificial intelligence ever have a power system to hold on to, so that way it becomes dangerous. Because that's the only way artificial intelligence could become dangerous, is when it's in the hands of a power system that uses it. And that's why it's so power dependent, not just on energy, but on who's using it. Think of this through many aspects, and I'll tell you that, that is really what it comes down to here, is who has the control of the artificial intelligence, who has control over these machines, these robotics, who um, is funding it, who disregards natural intelligence, who keeps seeking more, not feeling content within their own lives, who keeps seeking ruling over other human beings, and who doesn't, right? So these are the questions that ask that distinguishes somebody who is based in that natural intelligence and somebody who's based in a constant fixation of ego or left brain intellect imbalance of artificial intelligence. We have here, quote, a world technology means either a world government or world suicide. And both, if you ask me, do not sound very much natural. As we do know, government is based on man's law and immoral practices, again, the threat of violence, and everything is backed by such. Everything results in harm. We see democide time and time again, and I explain through multitudes of other videos why this is also the case. And so world government may sound like, oh, world peace and all these great things that they also want to promise, again, as a belief system for many folks, but does it have that basis of reality and nature is a question, and no, but they can try to manufacture and make everything in this world to that fitting to make it seem as if it's real and seem like it is totally possible. They can keep their control, keep their ego, their family and bloodlines in the position that they are in. But think of the opposite of this quote would then be to say a world nature means freedom means just is living with truth because truth is what just is it doesn't need anything new to go into existence nature is just nature it's all around us so there's nothing we have to worry about we leave worry we leave desire and ego and we just live our life isn't that what we want to do isn't what that what most people want to do in this life is just live our life so why are we dependent on these intelligences which is only artificial intelligence, frankly, that is disconnecting us from our natural self. Because if it's not natural, then it's not natural. And, and if it isn't unnatural, then it is natural. So it's either or here. Now, we see here, quote, I fear the day that technology will surpass our human interaction. The world will have a generation of idiots. So we want to make fun of, you know, this natural stupidity, say, you know, that's something, oh, artificial intelligence can't fix, sadly. Well, you know, the world is always going to have good and bad is by the laws of nature. And that actually proves why artificial intelligence can be so dangerous and... The fact that, you know, we have so many quotes by folks who are in these science fields themselves because they understand the nature of this technology because they worked on it. And the fact that we continue to create it. I'm not saying that we should just stop creating artificial intelligence. What I'm saying is that people need to know what is their natural intelligence 
need to know natural law and they need to know that the power system that be doesn't have the right to rule over their lives. And so if we let technology rule over our lives, we basically lost ourselves of our nature. We lost ourselves of reality. And so, of course, we have a world that is completely mixed and confused, believe it or not, despite the irony that, again, technology is going to tell us all the answers and create all the good things in the world and help us become our better selves. That's not the case here, because this very own quote by Albert Einstein debunks that within itself. And you'll see here a quote by George Washington. I mean, how, what more evidence do you need? Government is not reason. It is not eloquent. It is like it is force. Like fire, it is a dangerous servant and a fearful master. Never for a moment, never for a moment, should it be left to irresponsible action. Therefore, we'd have to program all our own artificial intelligence as the only way to trust it. It's the only way. But then you say, okay, well, <laughs> it's unrealistic, exactly. Because the only thing that you can do is be in charge of yourself and your own body and your own natural intelligence. And that is the most powerful thing you can do. Now, you know, computers, you're in charge of your own computer, for example, and, you know, you can decide whatever you want to do on that. And it's not ruling your life or telling you what to do. It's actually helping you become creative. Again, that's an example of artificial intelligence helping you. So irresponsible actions. What are irresponsible actions? It is actions that aren't responsible. Right? And we have to ask ourselves, well, are we responsible for our own being if we're so dependent on other people? Again, it's the very nature of government. Government would not exist if people just declared their independence as sovereign human beings that said, we don't need to be ruled over by anybody. Nobody has the right to rule under natural law. We see here, quote, government is not using modern technology so much to modernize and improve services as it is to regulate, punish, collect taxes, and keep an eye on us. They'd rather rule than serve. And this is a very old quote by James Cook, but yet it is so relevant to the world that we are moving into. And so it is to modernize and improve services. It's not. It could be used as such as a belief system, as an illusion to say, well, this is why we should uh, move it forward. But it is to regulate us by man's law. It is to punish us by man's law. It is to collect taxes from us by man's law. It is to keep an eye on us so that way they can have man's law and therefore they can't have opposers or people who will compromise their power and their, their rule over us, which they have no right to. So it makes it easier to control the population. That's what it ultimately does. No matter if anyone tells you whatever it does, as long as it's there in existence and it's able to do that, it is very well able to take more control of your own life. It is the very nature of such artificial intelligence, again, to go against nature in that regards. And therefore, instead of freedom, it would be slavery. Instead of instead of life, it would be no life, not consciousness. So people will have robotic friends or AI like Siri or Alexa that will tell them, you know, oh, have a nice day and so forth, but they're not going to feel that connection. They're not a real person, not a real friend. It's the illusion of having a friend, the illusion of having it real. And that's why it's so deceptive. And so we think it's okay, we can use it, we use social media, think that we're interacting with friends, but yet we're as lonely as ever, as we ever have been. And that's because it's the illusion of having it, the illusion of having uh, it's real. And it says here also another quote, relying on the government to protect your privacy is like asking a peeping Tom to install your window blinds. So, you know, as if the government already isn't controlling your life, you're going to give it more permission to. And again, it all comes down to you giving it permission to. Your statism is you and your belief that they have the right to do these things. And if you rely on the government to protect you, even though your own bodily protection is your responsibility because your body is your property, it is your life, only you have that, so it is your human right, are you going to protect your rights? Otherwise, the government are going to trample upon those rights and rule over your life because your life is your right and you're giving them permission 
so that way you can become their slave at that point. And that is what statism is, the legitimacy of saying, yes, you can rule over me. And folks will not realize, but that's what it is. Because you are saying, well, artificial intelligence, you can take over my natural intelligence. You can take it over. Just take it over. Take over my human intelligence and it will be fine. And the natural intelligence comes back and says, well, this is wrong. Okay. This is wrong. And therefore now you feel pain. Now you feel suffering. You know, now, now you see the problems with it. And that's where democide comes into play. And that's where we see, you know, the social relationships getting, uh, teared apart. That's where we see, um, these, these cycles of which government rises and constantly falls because, human beings never know their rights and they're constantly left in this cycle of dependence like oh well then we need a new system or we need a new ruler and it keeps the system constantly popping back up because folks constantly do not understand what is all around them what are their human rights are what is right and wrong what is natural law and so do not let the government rule over your life and therefore try to protect you as an excuse. You own yourself and therefore it's your responsibility to protect yourself. So this is a quote by John Perry Barlow. And we have another quote, he who controls the remote controls the world. The remote, a form of artificial intelligence, may you say. Julie Garwood. Now, of course, everything has a different level of artificial intelligence, may you say. But regardless, the same functions at the same end of the day. You know, instead of you changing the channel yourself, the remote's going to do it for you. Uh, and instead of you seeing something for yourself, the TV is going to show it for you. Uh, you know, instead of getting up and, and becoming part of something, the TV is going to make you feel like you're part of something and you're there in that moment. You know, this is the illusion of having it real. Quote, Whoever controls the media controls the mind. The media, a form of technology, a form of artificial intelligence. You have the question, you know, is artificial intelligence going to contribute to the newscasters, to the scripts, as we do see with teleprompters, uh, and fixing things, autofix, and not being allowed to say certain words that are all being tracked um, through online newspapers and so forth. Media includes anything from technology to videos to articles, anything. Uh, it's not limited to journalism. And so it's anything that we expose ourselves to as like a video um, stream, um, which is just most popular in today's world because, again, it seems most realistic and therefore controls the mind because our minds get wrapped around it. And we are deceived into saying, well, this is the real deal and it's easy for me because they put it right in my house. It, they, it's all around me. And it's around everybody and everybody uses it. So therefore I must use it. It's this sense of control that eventually just wraps everybody around it. And you'll see the same thing with the food supply. You see here, quote, who controls the food supply controls the people. Who controls the energy can control the, con the whole continents. And who controls money can control the world. Because, of course... You know, the media is dependent on money. People are so-called dependent on money, even though it's really just the fruits of their labor. Not to be seen as something that is constantly a debt slave to a government. And, you know, this is a quote by Henry Kissinger. Somebody doesn't have the best reputation in government for the very reason that uh, he's part of this control system. And you'll see the same quotes, you know, being said by for example, uh, the Rothschilds or the certain or the bankers themselves who say, I care not who writes the laws, controls the money, controls the world and so forth. Um, this has been said by many folks. And so think of the same thing when it comes to technology, of course, because as we saw with the media, as we see with food, these are all forms of consumption, all forms of power. And what, again, consumes the most power is artificial intelligence, technology it's actually the most dangerous. And then that's why we see Elon Musk saying that it is as equivalent, if not worse, than nuclear warheads. But yet, they're working on it. You know, they think it's inevitable anyways, or maybe they should be in charge of it to be responsible for it. But what about after their time? Again, you know, looking at this, 
robots can outlive human beings. The this superhuman supercomputer brains can outlive humans. I get that, right? And again, with no regard to natural intelligence, no care for natural intelligence, um, we are stuck in this area of desire and stuck in this area of ego and left brain dominance that the intuition is completely forgotten until it bites us in the butt. You know, it bites us back into saying, well, we probably should change the world for the better by simply learning what is the world, by simply teaching others what is the world, by simply teaching what is all here and around us, not actually introducing anything new. And that's why you see here this quote, we're changing the world with technology, a quote by Bill Gates. And again, somebody who's criticized a lot because he's part of this control system. We're changing the world with technology. Does that mean good or bad? You know, it could be either or, just again, keeping that in mind. We're changing the world. People automatically think that's good. No, it could be good or, or it could be bad. And it depends also on who. It says we're. Well, who's we? Who's the one that has the technology? Who's the one that has access to it most? Who's the one that keeps in charge of all the databases, right? And we see time and time again that even with simple webcams, people are being spied on. Even with simple emails and certain simple things that don't require super complex algorithms, they're already taking control of people's lives. Simple social media emoticons and um, you know people using those emotes to express their feelings is already taking up everybody's time in their life and preventing them from being creative or doing something productive with their life. It's preventing them from being better because now they're wasting their time doing something else, which they could have done something other than that to be more productive, to to follow their, their nature or enhance their nature more and become more creative as they are intended to be because human beings are creative. All they have to do is just tap into it. Hence, again, tapping into natural intelligence. So then you see here another uh, headline here. Elon Musk, 5 to 10 percent chance for humanity to survive artificial intelligence. But yet we'll work on it. <laughs> uh, quite the delusion and the irony here. It says France uh, says it's developing bionic super soldiers because, quote, everyone else is doing it. So therefore, I guess it must be right because everyone else is doing it. You know, everyone else is doing it. And so therefore we have to because, you know, we need to defend ourselves as a as a government with these imaginary borders, with imaginary laws. None of it of which is based in nature. None of it which seeks to educate anybody about nature because you don't have to feel obligated to to developing this artificial intelligence because every nation is. You can be the first nation to start waking up the world to what is natural intelligence before everybody gets hurt. And that's what people need to do. It's bravery to get out of the current state and condition of what it actually is. And so, you know, we see here how artificial intelligence can tackle workplace stress. You know, it's pretty cool. University uses artificial intelligence to target pandemic stress on campus. So artificial intelligence will help us with our health. Yet, uh, you know, what we see is the exact opposite if we look up technology and how it affects our health. Well, isn't technology artificial intelligence? I mean, Wikipedia said artificial intelligence is through machines. Is machines not technology? It is. It basically is one and the same here in this regard of term usage. Uh, even though, again, I would separate artificial intelligence as opposed to, um, you know, of course, what could be called ancient intelligence, but rather just human expression and creation. And so we have here stressed in a job, an AI teammate may know how to help. Automation and AI actually re relieves workplace stress. But yet again, looking at technology and stress, uh, it says four ways technology can increase your stress without you even noticing. And that's what we see again with AI is this unconscious uh, bad things that are happening to us, but we're unconscious of it because we're suppressing our intuition. We're so left brain focused onto what's happening with the world around us. And um, we're so dependent on them. And you say, OK, well, dependence and just following orders, that's right brain imbalance. Well, yeah, it is, of course. But 
that doesn't mean we're still seeking our intuition or our free will because free will is left brain and you know that intuition is right brain and just because we're imbalanced in our right brain does not mean we're using all the good aspects of the right brain because the good aspects of the right brain are supposed to work with the good aspects of the left brain right they can't be considered good unless they're part of the balance of the other side so does technology cause anxiety you know we see that as well um, we see the relationship between technology and anxiety and stress and they are more frequently also experience higher stress levels if people use their smartphones for example you know we see so many articles on this how technology makes us anxious always on technology stress and anxiety research roundup technology and anxiety modern technology causes of stress and anxiety i mean there's so much and there's even a slide here it says how does technology affect mental health sleep depression addiction 24 7 stress fear of missing out isolation incivility insecurity anxiety there you see it all and then more slides negative impact of technology on human health technology can have a large impact on users mental and physical health beside affecting users mental health use of technology can also have negative repercussions on physical health mental and physical problems include psychological issues such as distraction narcissism expectation of instant gratification and even depression physical health problems by the way we're already seeing that now and artificial intelligence is not even all that advanced we see exaggerated mobile use something that can cause cancer okay how are you going to prevent that if people are always on screens within itself right you can't prevent that with artificial intelligence unless you completely redesign the very nature of technology which is an artificial intelligence um poor sleeping habits using a laptop or a cell phone late at night is something very useful i mean usual and simultaneously very destructive for the brain and vision problems so you'll say okay well not all those are ai and ai will learn and fix all that if they're programmed correctly so many ifs if they're programmed if they're programmed correct if they're and then we'll go through the list and we'll keep finding more things that are problems and we'll end up again still in this analytical mindset not fixing what is here what is now in the present and not just living content but constantly in this this system of desire for the systems of control ultimately at the end of the day how is that any what helpful for us you see here a video this is the description of a video by the school of life it says artificial intelligence it says should we be scared of artificial intelligence and all it will bring to us not so long as we remember to make sure to build artificial emotional intelligence into the technology so we're going to give intuition into technology this is nonsense we can't do that uh, they can't they can't be conscious they can't breathe like humans do and if they are supposedly they're going to be convinced that they can uh, but they can't really and so that is the problem here it's the illusion the deception the delusion the oppression the suppression all those aspects make up um, what is taking away from the unnatural i mean taking away from the natural and making unnatural uh, and we think that is natural and that's where the illusion is so we talked a lot about this already and really put this into a lot of different perspectives but this one diagram puts it all into perspective and so i encourage you to look through this diagram and perhaps start at where it says natural intelligence that's why it's circled and again notice the source of that is god's source or otherwise true power natural law um, or just nature and it's to simply be with what is right natural intelligence is just what is the world is inherently intelligent and so everything works as its own intelligence you know whether we like it or not that is the natural intelligence of the universe now you'll notice these arrows are very particular as well and you'll notice there's an arrow that is two-sided on the left hand side from human intelligence to human creation but it's crossed off and that is because most people who look at the relationship between artificial intelligence and how they affect humans are only looking at that they're only looking at human intelligence and human creation and going right back to human intelligence 
they're not going to natural intelligence or going back to natural intelligence. Um, they're not realizing the connection that artificial intelligence impacts natural intelligence and that human intelligence depends on natural intelligence, right? And so then there's also that um, double-sided arrow on the left, I mean, on the right top, which uh, goes in and out from spiritual intelligence to natural intelligence because they're interconnected. And that's because, of course, you know, looking at spiritual, breath, consciousness, uh, or may you say God, or, you know, creation, and so forth, you know, this is where we have the intuition. And we realize how important that is when it comes to natural intelligence. It's not all that important because we still have intellect in the process. That's where artificial intelligence comes into play. You know, that's where natural intelligence comes into play. Um, but that's why everything must then cross the intuition and everything passes you, everything passes nature. Um, otherwise, it wouldn't be in existence. And we realize all this is interconnected. And that's why true intelligence is when we manage to have an understanding, a grasp between all these aspects. So that's what's at the center here. It's spiritual intelligence, natural intelligence, human creation, and human intelligence combined. So it's knowing, really, uh, the right actions to take um, based on intuition and intellect. And that's why you see under human creation, you know, it could be intellect plus intuition, or it could be demand plus order following. So again, if we're using human creation as a bridge or interference, if we're using it as a guidance mechanism or for control, it can be a machine source or an expression source, depending on, you know, the who, depending on the power. Because if it's just a human expression, the power is very low and the power comes from self. It is not dependent on the power, illusionary power systems that be where we're giving our power away, right? And they're the only who is ourselves because we're expressing ourselves and it's not power intensive. But if it's machine source and that machine is created by, you know, somebody else and there are certain human beings to which its allegiance is to and its power is intensive, um, what we see is that the who and the power question at the bottom of this diagram um, is rather invasive or rather uh, an interference or for control, as mentioned, it is not a bridge, not a guide. It is rather um, uh, very forceful, right? It is it is something that um, goes beyond the, the boundaries of regular expression to something that says, well, we can take human expression to the next level. And this is the ultimate form of human expression. It's artificial intelligence. It expresses for you. Well, then you don't have human expression anymore. You have demand plus order following, and you don't have intellect plus intuition. So then we have here as another uh, representation for what human creation can be, is it could be human for human for nature or human for robot for human. And you can say, oh, well, that's also for nature. But again, you know, going right to the source, are we going from human intelligence to natural intelligence or human intelligence to artificial intelligence and having to always go through the robot for everything as it's opposed to nature, having to always go through what the science and academics and the cultures and the governments tell us as opposed to just listening to what our body is telling us as opposed to what the universe is telling us. And therefore, the source that we're seeking is not God, but rather this archon like um, God, this artificial uh, man-made source type of God. So that's why the source is very important here. And that's why power is very important here. You know, who is in charge of natural intelligence? Well, it's God. Who's in charge of artificial intelligence? It's the machine. It's the, the people behind the machine, which is likely not you. And again, you know, how much power does it consume? Well, we don't have to really worry about that when it comes to natural intelligence. Um, in fact, you know, we learn just about the right amount, right amount for ourselves to just keep learning and have an experience and have awarenesses and have mysteries and adventure. Whereas machines are just going to tell us it all just blatantly as it is and everything just seems so fixated and constricted. We, we lack that intuition, that, that feeling of purpose and great mystery in the world and therefore the world feels a bit more bland. Uh, it feels a bit more um, 
not real and we want something that is real internally as a desire and don't know how to achieve it so we keep seeking those artificial means but it never makes us feel content so these are just some examples upon what is being displayed here because this can be seen in many different ways that middle path there of course with the human creation is a great part of why this diagram is portrayed the way it is right so our human intelligence is um, derived on our natural intelligence or our spiritual intelligence and um, that then goes out to what we create in the world you know inner to out uh, what we think is what we then create um, what we think is what we act upon it's our behavior which again is dictated by natural law so that's why we have natural intelligence always as the result of that but always as the beginning uh, to that as well so nat natural intelligence nature ultimately is always the answer to the questions that we have here um, as to is artificial intelligence good is human intelligence um, you know something that is going to help us well of course right i mean we have it for this ability to think and understand what's going to harm the universe what's not what's going to make our lives better what's not and you know artificial intelligence can't decide that for themselves and so um, they can be influencing the natural intelligence um, and again depending on uh, the nature of that human creation again the source the uh, power consumption the who uh, and the other aspects as mentioned there's questions that can be asked upon this, such as deism, uh, you know, where natural law fits into this, which is, of course, everything, but within natural intelligence and uh, action, right? Because if we're taking action, that's our creation, and we should want that to work in alignment with nature. Uh, and that's our ambition, but it should also be based then on our intuition. So it makes sense we go from spiritual intelligence to human intelligence to creation. Uh, so it's our intuition merging with our intellect. And deism is usually actually just understanding the world around us and the, and the laws of the world to then understand um, the creator, or understand um, and live in harmony with the world around us, per se. Or you could say it's, it's more of a religious doctrine because deism as in deity as God uh, it's it's just learning through nature to harmonize with nature. That's what it is. And so the emphasis on this diagram is that all must go through nature and you must choose where to go, right? And to where do you go? And that's what the in and outs are for here. And the true intelligence is showing true as in, you know, what is the righteous intelligence, where to be for your own intelligence, your own human intelligence. Well, you want to be human. You want to realize the power of intuition. You want to realize the power of creating action and not just doing nothing and not just being a slave either. So, uh, and not just overthinking everything. So it's all these aspects together and that's what makes up true intelligence. So I would also refer to the other diagram that was shown nature versus denature. And I'll put that on the screen for you there. And that helps us add more perspective as to what's natural and what's unnatural, uh, so that the word artificial makes more sense in this, in this light of things. Because if you merge these two diagrams together, then you'll get a bigger picture between the whole world of your understanding of these concepts. But this is how I perceive uh, intelligence as it is. So I appreciate everybody for watching, and hopefully this whole video uh, puts things into... A greater perspective so you may see that really our problems live with the power systems that be not so much um, with artificial intelligence itself but that artificial intelligence is dependent on if we're using our natural intelligence and if we keep that in restoration keep that in defense keep using it and don't become slaves independent on artificial intelligence and completely surrender our human soul and spiritual intelligence to that of the physical, material, um, godless, uh, artificial intelligence. And so that's important if we want to live on and to have purpose and to not be dependent on the system and to actually have our freedoms and have mystery and adventure. So I appreciate it. This is Corey Angelot, Nature is the Answer. <laughs>